Alrighty, so I'm going to go ahead and start recording here. Um, again, thank you guys for joining me on this Tuesday. Um, I know that it is difficult to find the time to uh, attend an all-day training at this point, but I really appreciate everybody being here. And of course, um, for any folks who are willing and able to deploy, this is a prerequisite. Um, of being able to uh, participate in those activities. And uh, for the folks that are hopping on, just to learn more about uh, AmeriCorps and their uh, their part in disaster response on the national and local level, thank you guys for joining. Uh, of course, my name is Michael Rojas. We'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, so just a little bit about myself, just so everybody uh, knows and aware. I am the disaster program officer here uh, at Volunteer Iowa. I help uh, build up disaster capacity uh, across the state, uh, working with local networks, but also uh, our state networks, and also uh, help managing our state AmeriCorps disaster response teams. Um, of course, which we have many, which include the Conservation Corps of Minnesota, Iowa, uh, Borough Clan Trust and the Habitat uh, for Humanity Mobile Response Team primarily. Uh, and I bring this slide up um, often and not only for uh, program managers, but for members as well. Uh, of course, not because I'm narcissistic and I want to talk about myself um, for the first five minutes of a presentation, uh, but I like to just show how national service can lead to different opportunities and career opportunities. Um, Myself, I used to be in education before coming to Iowa, uh, and I took a term of service, and I was with the Habitat for Humanity mobile response team, so I am an alum of state national program, um, and through that, we participated in two disasters, um, somewhat historic for the area as well, the 2018 Marshalltown tornado recovery efforts, uh, so we worked to rehab and repair uh, several homes um in the marshall town and marshall area and um i think by through this presentation you'll you'll realize that my qualifiers for numbers and time uh can be a little inaccurate at times so we i think by the end of it helped over a uh, hundred homes and definitely helped or if closer to around 200 i think uh, and then we participated in the 2019 Southwest Iowa flood response. We were mucking and gutting in Fremont and Mills County. Uh, and that really sparked my passion, particularly for disaster response. Uh, and I decided to pursue this as a career opportunity. So I was fortunate enough to be hired on um, as the county coordinator for Habitat for Humanity of Iowa. Uh, and through that, we had a couple unprecedented disasters, which include the COVID-19 pandemic, um, of which we responded to food insecurity, um, going to the Northeast Iowa food banks uh, under the governor's proclamation. And we'll, we'll talk uh, in task force, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and the 2020 derecho, if you were local, um, just a run of the mill category four hur land hurricane. Um, and I led that response as the incident commander, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, in Eastern Iowa for a time, I was sleeping out of a children's camp for about two, three months. If anybody knows Camp Wapsi, uh, highly recommend it. It was a lot of fun. Um, and then and inevitably, I ended up here at Volunteer Iowa as the disaster program officer. Uh, and I've been fortunate enough to get uh, a few out of state disaster deployments, uh, which include supporting Nevada's vaccine efforts. Uh, and then I was the incident commander in New Jersey. Uh, responding to the remnants of Hurricane Ida, of course, we had uh, around 86 to 90 um, ADART members uh, and staff deployed to that. So, but since I introduced myself, uh, I do want to give opportunity. I, th I think we have a pretty fair amount of people to where we can uh, make this uh, uh, the least painful as icebreakers go. Uh, so I'll go down the list, uh, and if you're able to unmute yourself or put uh, your answer in the chat, um, this is a great activity. I left it on here uh, just in case you are thinking about icebreakers. Uh, this is actually one that is super fun when we have this training in person. Um, but really, I'm just going to call 
Uh, and I would like for you to just introduce yourself if you have any disaster experience and if you think um, vegetables or fruit are a better uh, pet name for a pet. So if a fruit name is better for a pet or if a vegetable name is better for a pet, like if you're naming your pet mango or if you're naming your pet like celery or lettuce. Uh, so Claire, uh, you are the first one on my list. If you are able to unmute yourself and just introduce yourself, if you have any disaster experience and fruits versus vegetables for pet names. Good morning. Uh, my name is Claire and I'm program manager at Rise AmeriCorps. I do not have any disaster experience, thank goodness, or not. We'll see. And I am of the fruit category. I think mango or peach might be a pretty cute name, but broccoli also sounds adorable. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you're so right, Claire. Bro broccoli is a pretty good one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth, if you're able to unmute yourself or you could put your answer in the chat. Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth and I'm in Dubuque, Iowa, Lutheran, Iowa, AmeriCorps our energy and community team, so we do lots of home energy audits. I guess you could say that might be like disaster relief experience, um, depending on the kind of home that you're serving in, but I don't really have any okay. official experience with disasters. Um, I'm totally team vegetable, I have to say. The first thing that came to my mind was cucumber or cuke. You know, <laughs> I love vegetables, so. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that's awesome. Thank you, Elizabeth. And I, I would agree that in certain aspects that would uh, definitely classify as some some disaster experience. You know, it's it's really all encompassing and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so we have Aaron next on my list, if you wouldn't mind unmuting or putting your answer in the chat. Hi, this is Aaron. Uh, I am with Green Iowa AmeriCorps in Cedar Falls in the energy and community team. I don't have any disaster experience, but I live in Marshalltown now, so we're still cleaning up from the tornado. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> and I, uh, I'm going to go with vegetable. I think carrot would be an adorable name. OK, all right. <laughs> Uh, and yes, uh, yes, it does take uh, quite a long time, especially for a catastrophic disaster like that to, to really recover. I was just in Marshalltown yesterday um, and it's it's really come a long way since I was there originally, um, but there's still so much to do post disaster. So it, it has it has come a long way. The duration did not help. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I was in Marshalltown uh, during the derecho too. Um, so. <laughs> Two, two disasters that I've gone through personally. So Hurricane Sandy, I was in New York for that in Manhattan and then the derecho. So two uh, storms, if you will, that was great. Uh, so I see potentially that Ashley, Tenny uh, and Tawny from Volunteer Iowa have joined and they're usurped my list. So I'll turn to them. Uh, so we're just doing introductions, who you are, um, if you've had any disaster experience and fruits versus vegetables for pet names, where do you lie? OK, I'll go now that I'm sorry, we had uh, complications with figuring out the room situation. Uh, so Ashley Tenney, uh, volunteer Iowa program officer, work with a lot of the AmeriCorps programs in the state here. Um, I have not had direct like disaster response um, experience. However, in my previous role before coming to Volunteer Iowa, I did work on a disaster um, individual assistance grant through the state. So more of the recovery side and getting folks uh, the money they need to buy a furnace or other things that were destroyed in a disaster. So I have that kind of grant administration side of disaster. So um, also, I'd say not fruit or vegetable at all, but I'm going to go with only X-Men characters for naming <laughs> beings in my life. So I'm going to go off script there. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thanks. 
Um, hi, my name is Tony Shire. I'm the other AmeriCorps program officer on Walter Iowa staff. Uh, my background is in AmeriCorps, not specifically disaster relief, but um, I was with Campus Compact prior to coming to Volunteer Iowa. Uh, I don't really have a preference one way or the other, except for, I don't know, is a rutabaga a vegetable? Whatever that is, uh, my friend group has like this running joke that unnamed things are like rutabaga. So that would probably be my answer. Love it. Love it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you guys. Uh, We're already Brett. following directions, so you're welcome. <laughs> you're fine. Just had to create an other category for this tally, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Greg White, would you uh, be so kind to unmute yourself or put your answer in the chat? Yeah, good morning. I'm Greg White. I'm the Kids on Course AmeriCorps Program Director in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And um, disaster experience, my home and neighborhood were struck pretty hard by the derecho, live in central Cedar Rapids. So um, did a lot of recovering myself and with uh, friends and family around here after that. Um, as far as pet names i think i would go with fruit um you know grape berry something like that seems, mm -hmm. seems like a good name for a pet to me i would agree greg i am definitely team fruit but my vote does not count uh <laughs> thank you for sharing jesse would you like to go next So Jesse has uh, shared their information in the chat. So program manager with COVID-19 recovery, disaster experience way back in college, New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, mucking and gutting through some rebuilds, and team fruit for a dog named Peaches. Oh, that is great. Thank you, Jesse, for, <laughs> uh, for that inclusion. We appreciate it. Uh, John, you are next on my list. Would you like to unmute and introduce yourself? Hi, Michael. Uh, it's John and Naomi. And I'm here Wes. too. Uh, Naomi and I are with the AmeriCorps MRT. And uh, I think we're both Team Fruit. Um, I've also been on two disasters, but Michael, you already know that because I was with you. And I have not. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys for joining. I really appreciate you guys being here. Uh, Katie, you're Okay, uh, Katie, if you're not able to right now, just feel free to put it in the chat. But Leah, I have you next on my list. Good morning, everyone. My name is Leah. I am one of the Green Iowa AmeriCorps program managers up here in Cedar Falls. Um, I was actually back in school. I was able to go help out after the like massive Joplin tornado um, was why my like volunteer experience that really stuck with me. They kind of like the tornado ripped through a whole neighborhood and tore off like the outer wall of a hospital so you could see into the hospital like from the road which was kind of freaky um but very rewarding to be able to help like the families that were there so that was fun uh and i'm team fruit for a pet i have a friend that has a cat named kiwi <laughs> that's great uh and that's that's pretty incredible that's i i know a couple job winners and um that's something that is is left a legacy um with americorps and just in volunteerism in general so uh less you are next if you're able to unmute yourself hey good morning everyone my name is les gunderson i am with habitat for humanity of iowa i'm an mrt construction leader uh, i was in derecho 2021 on the private side for debris cleanup and I assisted with Hurricane Ida in New Jersey through Habitat for Humanity of Iowa. Sorry, I have no preference for pet names as my daughter in uh, college in Arkansas does all the naming in our family. <laughs> That's OK, Les, and great to hear from you. Uh, Olivia, you are next on my list. Good morning, everyone. My name is Olivia Dove, 
and I am serving in Dubuque as a Green Iowa Land and Water, Green Iowa AmeriCorps Land and Water Steward. Um, I served in Cedar Rapids last year um, as a Land and Water Steward with a nonprofit called Trees Forever. And so I wouldn't say I have um, direct um, disaster recovery experience, but I would say maybe on the environmental side, I do as we planted hundreds of trees back into the urban tree canopy of Cedar Rapids. So that was definitely a labor of love, um, having seen that they lost 60% of their tree canopy. Um, and it still amazes me every time I drive to Cedar Rapids just to see how few trees there really are. So definitely looking forward to seeing the regrowth of that population in the next, you know, 10, 20, 50 years. Um, as far as pet names go, gosh, I, I really don't like food names for animals because like that just seems really weird. I don't know, because like we eat food and like calling our animals food names is odd. But I would have to say if I ever had a rabbit, I feel like not naming them carrots would be a big missed opportunity. Okay. So we'll leave it at that. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, Riley, you are next on my list. Hey everyone, um, I'm Riley with the City of Davenport's AmeriCorps program. I uh, do not have official disaster experience, um, but after Hurricane Katrina, I volunteered in New Orleans um, for about a week, um, working with uh, making hot meals for um, all of the workers down there. Um, and as far as uh, fruit or vegetable, I would say probably fruit like blueberry, but my, I would prefer plant, tree, bush type <laughs> names. My, one of my cat's names is Juniper, so. <laughs> That's awesome, Riley. Thank you. And as someone who has responded, that is incredibly important to get an awesome hot meal uh, at the end of the day. So we appreciate that as well. Uh, Sasha, you are next. Hi, good morning. Sasha Wise with COVID-19 Recovery here in Des Moines. I do not have any disaster experience other than our um, program is a disaster response, but looks different than, you know, it's a long-term recovery program versus uh, the sort of immediate need disaster response. Um, I am not a pet person, so I don't care what their names are, but I'm going to play along and say I'd like to have a horse <laughs> named Apple. So team fruit, team fruit. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's a great answer, Sasha. Uh, Sam, we have you up next. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Sam Harris, and I am in the energy and community team of Green Iowa AmeriCorps here in Dubuque. And yeah, I don't have a whole lot of disaster experience. Um, back in college in North Carolina, I did help out with the response to Hurricane Florence back in 2018. Um, yeah, I set up some uh, beds, like temporary bedding in the gym and also delivered food to the community. And let's see, I would say fruit would be my preferred uh, pet name category. I think peaches sounds decent, and let's see, uh, yeah, blackberry persimmon, I think could be a decent one, but those are the extent of my fruit names that I would find appropriate. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Sam. Uh, Sarah? Good morning. Um, I'm here in Dubuque with the AmeriCorps program and um, I'm the coordinator working with Heather. Uh, as far as disaster experience, uh, we as in partnership with our RSVP program and United Way helped um, facilitate the uh, par a part of the COVID-19 vaccine clinic. So assisting patients around to the different providers, helping them in and out of their cars if they needed it, um, just general questioning and even screening before they walked in the door. Um, this fruit vegetable question, is, I've been pondering it the entire time, and I'm gonna do half a point to each because I think it depends on the pet. <laughs> I am wholeheartedly supporting one syllable fruits and vegetables because when you're yelling for your puppy out in the yard, 
one syllable is best, but half a point to each. Okay. <laughs> very bureaucratic, Sarah. Very bureaucratic. Uh, Skylar and then Katie, if you wanted to go to round it out and then we can get uh, get into it. Hi, good morning. My name is Skylar. Um, I'm serving in Des Moines with Impact on their energy team. Um, I actually have a lot of disaster experience. I served um, with FEMA Corps in 2017, and then I'm also currently a FEMA reservist right now. Um, and also, I would probably go with vegetable. I think Pepper would be a cute dog name. Okay, um, I'll, I'll go last. <laughs> I'm Katie Silvis. I'm with Habitat Iowa. Um, I'm the program director, and so I work closely with their mobile response team. Um, I'd say most recently, the disaster experience for me would be um, I went with Michael and the team to Las Vegas for some COVID vaccine information. I don't know what we would call it, but it was very hot, and that's all you guys need to know. Um, and I think I'm on team vegetable. I'm very like team old man name. So all my pets are like Alfred, Howard, Hank, but I feel like vegetable is more sophisticated in the uh, dog naming arena, like little pickles. I saw a bean come in. I like that, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> all right. <laughs> awesome. Thank you guys. Uh, perfect. So. We have a wide range uh, spectrum of experience uh, and folks that have participated in disasters in, in various ways, right? And there's not one size fits all of response. Um, you know, we had a, an individual one time at a training discuss that uh, they felt that they weren't doing anything in a disaster because they were just handing out bags of ice on hot days. Uh, but I'll tell you that that bag of ice uh, can be a life changing thing for a responder, um, especially in that moment or for a survivor. So there are plenty of things that go into uh, disaster response and we'll touch on a few of them uh, as we go in and uh, a couple others. Uh, so I appreciate you guys hanging with me uh, on that. Uh, I appreciate everybody diving in um, uh, to our question, uh, but I, I think I you know want to be frank of uh, there is a lot of information in this, right? So there is a lot of talking and uh, with any presentation that I do or anything that I'm a part of, uh, I want to make sure that the folks that are attending are getting the most out of it. Uh, and I think that comes from a lot of anecdotal conversation uh, and just experience sharing and story sharing. Um, and we'll set some ground rules on that, but I very much encourage you guys to, even if you don't feel comfortable during the the course of the day, um, unmuting to put uh, answers in the chat, and I'll definitely do my best uh, to read and, and sound out uh, whenever there's a question. Uh, we do have a couple features um, like raising your hand or any reactions. Um, that Microsoft Teams allows you to do. So if there is a question, feel free to unmute, uh, post it in the chat or raise your hand and I'll uh, do my best to uh, address them. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so this is our course overview and what we're going to be going over today, right? And although this is the rigid and the, the static of the schedule, this doesn't mean that we can't get into uh, some good conversation. Uh, like I said, I've participated in many responses uh, on many different levels to this point. Uh, so if there are any questions that pop up, please feel free to ask um, that anything that pertains uh, to disaster or anything that uh, may be bubbling in your mind. And definitely, uh, if you do have a question, you can put it in the chat and afterwards uh, I will go back and I'll try and respond to those folks that uh, had posted that. So. So today uh, we're going to go through a couple modules and they're broken down in units, right? So we have module one, which includes national service and disaster, uh, and that uh, has three units, which also goes over some FEMA uh, and FEMA mission assignment operations stuff. Uh, module two will go over understanding stress and disaster psychology because that is inherent uh, in response. So just under uh, understanding 
uh, the impacts of disaster and the psychology behind it and just understanding your own stress. Um, module three will go over safety and risk management. That is my favorite module. Uh, any response that I have been on, that is my number one rule. Uh, and I, I hammer that home all day, safety and risk management. We want everybody to come back uh, from a response with 10 fingers and 10 toes that they went into the response with. Uh, module four, we'll talk a little bit about uh, life on disaster missions. So you'll get a glimpse about what a typical ADART response um, might look like. Uh, so we'll go over a little disaster deployment prep, how to prepare for that, how to pack life on disaster operations, uh, and then we'll go over some media stuff because we do live in a modern technological age now. So we want to be uh, very sensitive to that and understand uh, what are the expectations with um, the DSU and ourselves when it comes to social media. So. Uh, so through this, we're going to discuss and utilize basic concepts of disaster deployments. We're going to recognize and demonstrate disaster emotional and mental health issues uh, and respond accordingly. We're going to explain and utilize foundational risk management skills, outline the importance of pre-deployment planning and expectations, describe and implement disaster deployment requirements, and explain and utilize appropriate media engagement and partner relations. Uh, so just setting some expectations and goals uh, and, and of course some messaging. So uh, we are a somewhat big group today, so I just want uh, to set the tone that uh, this is a safe space and we should um, be respectful of one another. Uh, someone speaking, allow them to you know get their point through and then uh, we'll have plenty of time to allow others to uh, jump in. Uh, think about what your individual goals are getting out of um, this presentation and potentially even further past that. And please, uh, again, at all times, if you're able to uh, utilize the chat and other teams functions uh, that'll just allow this training to go uh, as smoothly as possible. Uh, again, so just some ground rules. Uh, anybody who is um, speaking, this is a safe space, a brave space. We want to allow uh, just the flow of thoughts and comments. Um, obviously, keep it appropriate, uh, but of course, I do want this to be an engaging and collaborative presentation. So at any time, please um, jump in. Uh, there is no such thing as a dumb question. Uh, we do live, of course, kind of in this uh, hybrid world, so please have some tech patience, not only with myself, but for others. Uh, you never know what's going to happen um, as you're going through, potentially at least here in downtown Des Moines. Uh, currently where I am, uh, there are outages uh, at various points, so um, please just be patient. Of course, anything that's said here, uh, we want to, uh, you know, encourage stories. Um, I know that a few of us have disaster experience, so if you wanted to share uh, some more pertinent information to the group, that'd be uh, that'd be terrific. Uh, and taking away lessons and, and moving forward from here, um, asking questions, and of course, we want to encourage diverse perspectives. Uh, this is a judgment-free zone, so please um, always feel free to speak up. Afterwards, I'm going to be sending out uh, a course evaluation. Uh, this is an entirely new course that the Disaster Services Unit has put together at AmeriCorps, the agency. Um, so this is the first time with kind of a bigger group that we're presenting this. So uh, my feelings will not be hurt by any way. I am just teaching this information um, and have experienced this. Uh, so anything that um, you guys can provide as feedback and I'll be sending that out afterwards. Um, they're helpful not only for myself to be better as a instructor uh, and a teacher, um, but also to um, gear this content to what we need it to be uh, and to allow you guys to really get the most out of it. Of course, little housekeeping rules. Uh, if you do have an emergency, feel free to step away. Uh, please do not stay on uh, if you have something that is um, uh, pressing. Uh, if you need to go and get a cup of coffee or water, please do so. 
uh, I will be taking a, um, I will be talking a lot, uh, so I will be taking a lot of <laughs> coffee breaks. Um, particularly after every module, we take a five, 10 minute break to allow everybody um, to have time to go do that, uh, but to also go to the restroom. Um, but please, if you need to go to the bathroom, go ahead. Um, just ensure that you're muted, your camera's off. Uh, we don't want any surprises here. So let's dive into it. Uh, so module one, National Service in Disaster Introduction. Uh, so unit one, of course, uh, we're going to be going over National Service and Disaster Services, and then we're going to be diving into any uh, diving into FEMA and what uh, that means to us. <clears throat> so unit one, National Service and Disaster Services. So let's talk about it. So what is AmeriCorps and the DSU? Uh, history of National Service and Disaster Response, some pivotal points um, as it pertains to AmeriCorps and ADARTS, AmeriCorps Command Structure, and AmeriCorps Disaster Resources. So our objectives here are going to be outlining the National Service role in disaster response, understand the evolution of National Service operations, and summarize the AmeriCorps command structure and how this structure benefits streamlined operations. So what is AmeriCorps? I really hope that everybody that is in this training would be able to tell me. Um, but of course, AmeriCorps is a federal agency um, and it brings people together to tackle the country's most pressing challenges through national service and volunteerism. Uh, AmeriCorps members and AmeriCorps senior volunteers serve with organizations dedicated to the improvement of communities. So there are many AmeriCorps organizations uh, across the US, but also here uh, in Iowa. And AmeriCorps is actually written into two national disaster frameworks as supporting agencies, right? So we're not first responders, but we do support, um, as we've talked about, uh, some folks have shared out. Uh, so the National Disaster Response Framework we're written into you and uh, the National Disaster Recovery Framework we're written into. So very important distinctions of response and recovery. Um, and we'll go over that a little bit later. So just some fast facts. Right. Uh, so we have 40,000 uh, communities served across the US, uh, which totals a 1.6 billion hour served. And um, we currently have around 75,000 um, AmeriCorps members serving, uh, at least from when this was created, which was a couple months ago. So could be up or down. Um, but uh, like uh, we were discussing, we are written into two frameworks, which would uh, allows us uh, to respond uh, and to obviously do the great things that we do uh, as AmeriCorps. So I talked a little bit about uh, what the DSU is, um, or at least mention them briefly. So again, we have a lot of acronyms here. Uh, disaster loves acronyms. Um, everything is abbreviated and, and broken down. So if there's something that I say that is just because, you know, I'm used to saying it, I'm going to do my best to uh, always expand on them. But if you're like, uh, Mike, what the heck is that? Uh, please stop me and ask for clarification. I would love to clarify, of course. Um, so the DSU is broken down into two sections. So we have disaster specialists, right? So they have a lead disaster specialist. Uh, which oversees day-to-day -day direction and management of the DSU. Uh, and then we have uh, the regular disaster specialists, which of course uh, kind of managed uh, the AmeriCorps disaster response teams. And they, they talk with uh, FEMA mission assignment folks uh, and are really kind of our direct line there. But the missions of the DSU, of course, uh, is to uh, maintain our agency role as leader in disaster services among federal partners. So, of course, um, they are located in D.C. Uh, and they're able to, um, with that, be able to communicate and, and really uh, be champions for our role in disaster. Uh, they increase capacity of communities to prepare for, mitigate, respond to, and recover from disaster through agency programs. So through our work, 
uh, we're able to go into communities and not only be able to do that response, but recovery, um, but really all facets of the disaster cycle, which include mit mitigation, um, preparedness, response, and recovery. And we are committed to assisting communities uh, to build that disaster resilience. Um, so, of course, the functions of the DSU uh, coordinates preparedness, mitigation, response, and recovery uh, is the central hub for all national um, service disaster related efforts. So, they're really the go to, um, and they are the ones that really rally uh, the aid arts when there is a response. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we go on. And they uh, ensure engagement is appropriate, consistent, and coordinated. So there are rules uh, that we kind of have to abide by as aid arts and uh, programs, and the DSU um, really are the operators of that. And this training is somewhat of that standard too. Uh, they want to make sure that we're all on the same page and we have that consistent messaging. Uh, so we really are able to build our brand and build our image in disaster. So training uh, technical assistance and operation coordination for FEMA mission assignments. So whenever we get sent out for a FEMA mission assignment, they are the ones that are really uh, providing that support. Uh, anything that we need, if we need technology, any training, uh, just in time trainings, we'll talk about that. Um, uh, any other type of operational coordination for us to uh, to do the things that we do. Um, a lot of those direct service activities or capacity building, they're really the ones that are able to get us started and get us into the positions that we need to be. Uh, so we are very thankful for them. Uh, and they were a mighty team of three, but they recently just increased to a mighty team of five. Uh, so they're really on their way and we've really come uh, a long way in a, in a short amount of time. And I'll show some timelines. Uh, so our history of national service and disaster right so of course this isn't all of the things that we participated in um but they are definitely uh some of the most important and every uh gold star that we have um on screen right now are specific ones that iowa has participated in um so we had the historic 2008 iowa floods uh, we sent folks to Hurricane Sandy, and we were pretty crucial in, in that coordination. Uh, we sent folks to South Carolina. We had some flooding in Missouri, and we participated in that as well. Um, of course, the historic 2017 hurricane season, which included Harvey, Irma, and Maria. Uh, we sent some lucky folks to the Virgin Islands, U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, 2019, we had mentioned before, uh, and of course, the COVID-19 pandemic and hurricanes uh laura and sally um and now we have per, uh, participated in um some other out-of-state missions uh which include um vaccine initiatives in nevada uh and then of course hurricane ida in new jersey specifically so just giving you uh kind of a brief overview uh, i think it's important to note that our national service timeline uh really started um with the Oklahoma City bombing, right? So, of course, this is not an all inclusive list again, uh, but we really wanted to just hit home that uh, these are some uh, pretty important events uh, that really uh, have allowed us to grow and to change as aid arts and as a disaster response agency. Um, so, of course, with the Oklahoma City bombing, they deployed AmeriCorps there. Um, really not sure of, of what they were going to do right you never know what those needs are um, but it was really our, our kind of first toe in the water if you will um, and something that americorps definitely has is people power uh, and a lot of the time we will get calls and we're like well we we just need you here to you know be able to provide some surge capacity building and then we with our unique set of skills are able to really fit in um, where we were needed as as appropriate and as deemed by the DSU. Um, so Hurricane Katrina uh, was the first uh, mass use of national service resources at the local, state, and national levels. 
Uh, and then that was actually the establishment of the uh, AmeriCorps Office of Emergency Management, um, which will later become uh, the DSU. So um, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, the DSU uh, is born. So that was really the first time uh, we had like multiple events that needed coordination, right? So we, so AmeriCorps, the agency spawned uh, through the um, uh, Office of Emergency Management, the DSU, to really oversee this and to be the facilitators um, of these uh, disasters. Of course, we mentioned Joplin. So this was one of the largest uh, AmeriCorps responses. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what their impact was there um, later, but it was a EF5 um, multiple vortex tornado that completely just wiped out the city of Joplin and um, it was where AmeriCorps was on the ground after a couple hours, uh, and they were really able to play a pivotal role in, in that community, being able to get where they are. And uh, with cost share, we ended up saving around $17.7 million to the community and to the, um, to the county and state uh, through just documented uh, volunteer hours. and. Uh, we have a section on that coming up. Uh, Hurricane Sandy is where FEMA Corps um, was uh, was launched. Uh, so FEMA Corps being kind of a subsidiary subsidiary of that, um, but they are ones that really help FEMA build capacity during a, a disaster, right? So uh, they saw a need and they were created, uh, and then we kind of had a ADART relaunch. Um, following Hurricane Sandy, um, there is a lot of lessons learned uh, through that response, especially operating in such an urban environment. Um, it was pretty catastrophic, me being in New York. Um, you know, I've only ever seen New York as a ghost town, uh, and that was the day of Hurricane Sandy. Uh, I could probably, you know, I could walk down Lexington Avenue all the way down and not see a single car. Uh, it was pretty surreal. And then COVID-19 was when I also saw New York uh, completely desolate. So some very stark realities, but a lot of lessons learned in disaster that allowed us to just uh, become stronger as a disaster response agency. Um, so we had the ADART and Cadre relaunch. So they saw the um, opportunity or the need uh, to get other folks trained up as a Cadre and a cohort to um, just be able to respond to multiple levels and to be able to give some folks a break, honestly. Um, it's really hard to sustain that level of just uh, involvement for a disaster for that long. So being able to have that uh, is pretty crucial. Then, of course, the 2017 hurricane season, uh, this was the first time AmeriCorps and ADARTS uh, managed uh, level one disaster response uh, simultaneously. So these were pretty huge responses, uh, just talking with folks uh, that were involved. Um, the setups were were pretty massive, sleeping at responder camps um, and just having so many eight arts on the ground. Um, it was it was pretty incredible to see uh, and to hear about, uh, but it really proved the effectiveness of why our AmeriCorps uh, command team structure uh, the DSU and other efforts uh, really mattered. Uh, I think in total there is around 5,000 uh, National Service members uh, and volunteers that were able to support in those efforts from our side. So uh, some pretty historic and pivotal points, at least in our history. Um, and it's important to note uh, that's just from uh, 1995 to where we are now. Uh, we've really, really come a long way in a short time. So uh, here we have the AmeriCorps response command structure. So we had talked about the national response framework, right, and the uh, national disaster recovery framework. So this is kind of where we fall into that. Uh, and really, I think if you could just take a look at the arrows, um, the structure just allows for communication, awareness, and coordination across all of the programs, especially when you're involved. Um, as uh, an ADARTS in the planning and the, the response and recovery efforts, it's just so seamless 
uh, and you you really appreciate not getting bombarded by you know 20 different folks um, and just having that one streamlined level of communicate uh, communication across all of the programs. Um, took a sip of coffee there. Um, but yeah, so you have the DSU, right? And they are the direct contacts for uh, NCCC uh, regional campuses and of course the AmeriCorps regional offices. Uh, and then through that, uh, we have our VISTA programs and AmeriCorps senior programs. Um, and of course the DSU coordinates um, directly with our state service commissions of which Volunteer Iowa is one. Uh, and then they connect with their in-state AmeriCorps programs and then go back. Uh, and the DSU also has direct lines to ADARTS, right? So they have that connection. Um, but they also have uh, the disaster cadre that they could bring in to continue to support efforts um, during a disaster. Uh, the main staff of the DSU will get things started, but of course, uh, like anybody, they deserve a break. Uh, especially with such an intense period of time um, and they're able to pull in other cadre. Uh, but the eight arts are really the uh, direct lines, the DSU uh, when we are deployed. Um, but when we're not, uh, this this structure is still definitely in play. Uh, we we provide the DSU to send up to the regional offices uh, some situation reports kind of as a courtesy. So anything that we're doing locally that isn't necessarily a major disaster declaration um, but can be classified kind of as like a state disaster um, we'll just share with what we're doing how we're how we're growing uh, kind of how we're operating within that um, so it's just something that really allows us um, to support each other and to kind of gather situa uh, situational awareness um, from the local all the way up to kind of our, our service levels. Um, so it's something that I definitely am appreciative of. So National Service Disaster Resources. So we talked a little bit about this, right? So this is kind of the main, um, but it's not, um, you know, what's what we aren't able to bring in. So we have our state and national programs, of course, um, and it's encompassing of our uh, main AmeriCorps disaster response teams, uh, AmeriCorps and Triple C, uh, of course, the National Civilian Community Corps. Um, they're able to be pulled in and um, they don't necessarily need to be under a FEMA mission assignments um, to deploy or to be a part of a disaster. Um, they're able to uh, be called upon the DSU and, and sent to support uh, in a different way. And, and we can talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, state service commissions, of course, um, I, I talked a little bit about that, but if you don't know what a state service commission um, is, uh, we kind of uh, oversee and administer our, our state programming through grant funding. Um, we're able to uh, do this with a, a variety of grants and be able to address uh, critical community needs and engage uh, citizens in service. So we're able to really do a lot at the state level. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we have our AmeriCorps disaster cadre, right? Uh, and those are folks, like I said, uh, that have been AmeriCorps employees that have been selected and trained and equipped to deploy on large scale or complex disasters. Uh, to really support the DSU and other partners. They really act as that bridge and that buffer, um, which is really needed uh, when we're on the ground between ourselves and FEMA, um, because we know how we operate and we need to kind of do things our way, um, but it's not always uh, what FEMA wants, so they kind of act as that mediary uh, in that bridge, um, which is, great and we are very uh we are very thankful for uh americorps vista of course um those are passionate members that bring individuals and communities out of poverty uh we have the fema corps uh which is uh, 
I don't think I mentioned it before, but uh, it is a unit of NCCC, right? So it's kind of a, a subsection, uh, if not a cross section, um, who work uh, are devoted solely to FEMA and disaster preparedness response uh, mitigation and recovery. So they're the ones that really go with FEMA to set stuff up and they're able to um, really support them in, in complex disasters. Uh, we have our senior programs, of course, um, and it's really just uh, a, an encompassing image of what uh, we're able to bring to the, the table as disaster response teams, right? So we've reached the end of that unit. Um, does we we have been cracking on for a little bit? Should we take, let's say, like a five minute break? Let folks stretch their stretch your legs, grab a cup of coffee, put it in the chat, or would you like me to keep going? All right, well, it's 8.55. Why don't we go ahead and take a five minute break and we'll come back at nine o'clock.
All righty, everyone. I hope everybody has grabbed a fresh cup of coffee like I have. Um, I personally use French vanilla creamer if I can, if not caramel. But you need it for uh, this exciting, absolutely stellar section. Let's talk about FEMA. Um, we'll chop right into this. Uh, I think I did not mention it before, uh, but we will be taking an hour lunch uh, starting at noon and we'll come back at 1 p.m. Uh, just so everybody is aware and doesn't feel as if we're going to uh, truck through uh, this. Um, although T, yes, uh, Earl Grey, anybody? Uh, does is it tea with milk or tea without milk? I feel like that's a pretty uh, hot button topic. A little bit of milk, OK. I think um, milk is important for tea. OK. Kind of a with milk, of course. OK, all right. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you guys. Uh, well, I hope you grabbed whatever is going to uh, allow you to learn about the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Let's talk about it. Uh, boom, there we go. What is FEMA? What is it? Emergency Management and uh, Disaster Escalation. We'll talk a bit about that. Uh, disaster declaration types and assistance. Uh, we'll talk about what a FEMA VAL is. Uh, and I talked a little bit about Joplin, right? How we were able to save um, that area, 17.7 or 17.8, I think, actually, uh, million dollars. Uh, and that was through the FEMA uh, donated resources policy. And we'll dive into that and we'll talk about that. And if there's literally anything that you take from this training, I hope you take um, this donated resources policy and why volunteerism during disaster really matters. So unit two objectives. Uh, hopefully by the end of this unit, you'll be able to summarize basics of emergency management and disaster declaration, escalation, sorry. Uh, identify basics of federal disaster declarations. Explain the role of FEMA VALs. Uh, and describe FEMA's donated resources policy um, documentation requirements. So what you're what you have to do in order to save that community those dollars, those coins. AmeriCorps, FEMA, why does it matter? What is FEMA? So FEMA is the Federal Emergency Management Agency, like I said before, right? So they are responsible uh, for all emergency management in the U.S. and its territories. So I said before that we were able to go to the U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, and that is because they are U.S. territory. We have sent some folks to Guam before. Um, yeah, to Guam. Uh, and from what I heard, that it was uh, an incredible experience, but also came with its unique and frustrating challenges, of course. Um, so we're not only able to serve locally and nationally, but also maybe pseudo internationally um, could be fun. They also provide a ton of training, technical assistance, funding and operational coordination and expertise to communities before, during and after disaster. And of course, like any agency that participates in this, um, they grow and adapt and learn. Um, so there were some pretty major um, major uh, additions uh, or revisions actually uh, to the Stafford Act um, and we'll we'll talk about it, about that. Um, but also we can't do anything without them. They are our major partner for disaster response. Uh, we're able to deploy under this escalation, right? So this is the emergency management escalation. And again, a lot of these concepts are like a thousand foot um, just overview, right? If you guys have any questions about what we're covering or what we're talking about, uh, please reach out afterwards or post your question in the chat. 
um, I'd love to spark some conversation. So a big thing with us in disaster, uh, and it's very true, is that disasters start local uh, and they end local, right? Um, so of course, an event is anticipated or occurs, and that's an important distinction of both. Um, the local government with their emergency plans, right? They try to respond. Uh, if it's very clear that the local uh, local government's capacity is being exceeded, um, that mayor can declare a state of emergency and request aid from the state, right? Uh, if it's something um, that is so catastrophic that it seems as if it's going to um, surpass the state's or territory's ability to uh, respond, if their capabilities are, are overwhelmed, right? Say folks um, that were part of that response got affected themselves because it was so widespread. Um, they have the um, opportunity to request aid from the federal government, right? So the governor uh, can ask for a presidential disaster declaration, and that's really where our bread and butter comes in, right? So once there is a major disaster declaration, which comes uh, directly from the president, um, we're able to deploy under a FEMA mission assignment. So the federal government evaluates the requests and declares a disaster if approved. So they don't necessarily have to approve that request, right? They can take a look at it and say, well, your state should potentially be able to respond to this. You know, it doesn't seem that bad. Um, or it's an event like Hurricane Henry um, or Maria where, you know, it's pretty evident that it's going to hit and it's going to be pretty catastrophic. Uh, so these things can be pushed through fairly quickly. Um, but it is a whole community approach, right? And we really want to get stuff back to the local government because they are the ones that are going to be there after the fact, um, after all the responders leave. Um, you know, it's it's really going to be that community that's going to be left with figuring stuff out with their long term recovery groups. Um, but yeah, so we do have uh, the distinctions of uh, what disaster declaration types and what type of assistance um, kind of fall under that. Um, so you have your declarations and then you have your emergency declaration, right, which may be before, uh, like I talked about, if you see a hurricane, you know it's going to be bad. Uh, recently, Hurricane Ida, that was the the um, that was the case where they knew it was going to be bad. It was really picking up a lot of steam as it got close to uh, landfall. Uh, so that's an emergency declaration, right? So that's able to um, essentially open up those resources and really eliminate any barriers to response um, for those folks, those responders in that impacted area. Um, major disaster declarations is typically what we uh, fall under or go through, right? Because the DSU wants to be sensitive to um, our safety and they don't want to put us in a position to um, really do more harm than good. They want to make sure that that state or territory uh, is ready for AmeriCorps assistance and for us to go in there to provide uh, the unique skill set that we do, right? Uh, so a major disaster declaration is usually uh, given after the fact, right? So during the derecho, um, it hit very suddenly. Uh, we were responding. Uh, our capabilities were exceeded not only at the local level, but the state level. Um, so we requested um, a disaster declaration after the fact, and I think it was President Trump um, that was signing that uh, and allowed us to open up um, resources and, and really push away any um, barriers to, to respond. So just allows more of an effective response, especially when uh, so much is, is ha happening in a territory or state. Uh, and then, of course, we go through um, the two types of assistance, right? Individual assistance and public assistance. Uh, and we'll talk a little more about that later. Uh, typically, we fall under the individual assistance of helping um, directly with with folks that have been impacted. And so FEMA vows, what is a vow, right? 
so they are voluntary agency liaisons, uh, and they are really critical partners um, for AmeriCorps and ADAR operations. I've worked very closely with FEMA VALS before, and they really do a lot of good of just giving you awareness of the community, uh, who the players that you need to connect with are to be able to not only gain resources, um, but to be able to do the things that, um, that we do, right? Uh, they could provide uh, connections uh, to other organizations, just give out information um, the DSU will usually connect with them, but you as ADARTS, uh, whoever is leading that mission, uh, will do that as well. Um, but really before, during, and after disasters, um, they, re they really do have a significance of contribution, not only to um, our groups, but to other groups, other uh, voluntary groups, faith-based groups, or other uh, community stakeholders that are going to be involved in that, right? Um, and really with a vow, um, a large part of their, their job is, is building those relationships uh, and really trying to support the whole community, right? Really trying to galvanize everybody that's uh, in their area uh, that they manage. So for Iowa, we are FEMA Region 7. Uh, and I think at this point we have three FEMA vows that cover our region. And we really work uh, very closely with them and myself specifically. And they are terrific and anything that you need, um, they will try to get for you. Uh, and even if they do not have an answer, they will try and connect you with somebody that may have an answer, right? So if you are trying to have a unique training or you need a, you know, uh, something for your community, they, they will do their best to figure that out. Um, but they are contacts for managing the ADAR mission assignments. So if we do have uh, ADAR MA in a region, they're the ones that really um, act as that, again, that mediator and that um, connection to FEMA. Uh, ideally, we don't have a lot of contact with FEMA during a mission assignment, but we will connect and talk to FEMA VALS um, and other, in our cadre and other uh, stakeholders that um, again, will be that buffer. <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about the FEMA donated resources policy, right? So these are the big categories uh, that I really want some folks to take away with, right? So um, this is under the Stafford Act, uh, and really there's um, a section in the Stafford Act uh, that establishes the criteria which federally declared uh, affected states uh, may be credited for volunteer labor, donated equipment, and donated uh, materials or supplies, as you see here, right? Uh, so like I said, because of our um, documented volunteer labor hours in Joplin, um, we were able to save 17.8 7, uh, million um, dollars for the city and state. And I mean, that was a very unique situation where they were able to um, essentially close off that outlining area of Joplin and funneled all of the volunteers through an area. Uh, and if you wanted to uh, participate in volunteering to, to help uh, in that response, uh, these were the things that you needed to include, right? So the big things were your name or if you have a unique identifier uh, where you're serving, right, the location of service, what you are doing uh, and trying to be as specific as possible and how many hours did you serve, right? So what's interesting about this stuff is that it was created, um, but there is really no specific form um, for any of this that that FEMA kind of sanctions, right? Um, so this really allows that in, in sticky situations for folks to um, be able to literally take a piece of paper and, and document volunteer labor hours or um, with donated supplies, right? You want to document the type, uh, how much, and where the donation was used. Um, and then for equipment, uh, which is one that is important that sometimes get lost to uh, the equipment type, uh, the location and hours used, and out-of-pocket costs to operate. Honestly, my responses in Iowa have been great because almost everybody has heavy equipment um, 
in, in on their properties or they have a neighbor with uh, heavy equipment, whether it be an ATV or or something along those lines, right? Um, that all can be documented and then returned uh, to really put dollars back into um, the state's pocket, right? Uh, so it really works as a cost share. Uh, so 25% under the Safford Act uh, is the uh, responsibility of the local government. And then 75% uh, is responsible um, for FEMA, right? Uh, so the federal government. So they'll hand uh, the state a check and uh, be like, here's your 25%, right? Um, and through that, uh, we're able to pay that as a soft match, cost match, um, with any of these uh, these documented um, categories, right? So whether it be volunteer labor, donated supplies and materials, or donated equipment. So after Joplin, uh, because of AmeriCorps and how um, specific they were with their documentation and how uh, just fastidious they were, um they were able to really maximize the amounts of that money right it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to you know what you document is what you're going to get yeah fema really always opens up to audits um opens it up to audits um which is why this still kind of has its criticisms but the more you document and the more specific uh and the more organized you are with it um really the better uh, for not only your community, but for the state. Uh, so whenever there's a disaster, if you go volunteer, ask them where the check-in is, ask them you know, where, where the documentation is, because your hours are dollars back into the state's hands. Okay, uh, that was the end of that unit. Um, some riveting stuff, I know. Uh, but do we have any questions, any reflections, any anything that anybody wants to bring up before I dive into mission assignment operations? Okay, hearing none. Um, if you do have anything, of course, always feel free to put it in the chat. Or go ahead and unmute yourself and say, Michael, hey, stop. I have a question. So. We'll continue right along. So we have our FEMA mission assignment operations. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have, uh, we're going to go over uh, mission assignments and aid art selection process, how that looks like, right? How we get selected to go into disasters, FEMA mission assignment types, uh, the ACT, the cadre, the DSU, and FEMA. Uh, mission priorities, ADART support services, disaster response partners, AmeriCorps and DSU mission expectations. So some fun stuff. By the end of the unit, you should be able to identify the FEMA mission assignment deployment process, compare and contrast DFA and FOS MAs. I won't say what that is yet. Understand how mission assignments are managed. ADART support services under a FEMA mission assignment, what are those? Uh, recognize critical disaster partners uh, and summarize AmeriCorps and DSU expectations. So this is really kind of the uh, the bread and butter of what we do, at least on paper, right? Um, and then we'll get into um, what this means for us in terms of direct service a little bit later. <clears throat> So this is really, again, that thousand foot overview of the FEMA mission assignments in ADART selection process. Um, we have our early development to our development and going into operation startup. Uh, and this can move as quickly um, or as slowly in some cases as, uh, you know, as possible. Um, but it does take a couple days, so we usually uh, say um, for our teams that are, are very direct with us and our, our main aid arts um, that you should be prepared to once you get the call to deploy within 72 hours. That's usually a good time frame. Um, I've deployed as quickly as 48 hours before, but it's also taken as long as two weeks, a week and a half or so. Um, so it's really a wide spectrum and it, it depends on the, the needs of the state, right? It's an exciting time. Um, 
but we also want to make sure that the state is ready for us um, and that when we go in there, we're not self deploying. Um, we're actually doing good uh, and not overwhelming the. The infrastructure of that community that's already been um, so heavily affected, right? Uh, so from early development, right? Uh, a disaster is declared. We talked a little bit about that, how that happens. Um, so an affected community or state, they realize um, prior to disaster declaration that aid arts are probably needed, uh, but they have to wait for this declaration. Uh, so after that, the DSU uh, contacts FEMA and state VAL uh, and the affected states and FEMA identify needs, right? So all of this is going on kind of in the early development. They're figuring out what needs to be done. Uh, what the um, actual need for us will be and what that is going to be written into the mission assignment. Um, and then through development, right, the state develops and submits the requests to FEMA. Uh, the DSU negotiates ADART support with FEMA um, and the DSU provides kind of that timeline uh, to the state with FEMA and other partners, right? So there's a lot that goes on uh, in each of these stages and the DSU really is integral in it. Um, and of course the DSU works to uh, select which ADART programs uh, are going to be sent and they also select who is going to be the incident commander, which under the ACT is the individual who's gonna be leading the response, right? So FEMA usually puts out FEMA usually puts out a call um, and they uh, contact ADARTS and they um, see where everybody's availability is and they, they figure out who's going to be the main program that's going to be leading that response. Um, in the last couple, Volunteer Iowa um, has been kind of the lead for that. So it's been pretty exciting to see Iowa kind of develop as one of the staples in the nation, at least as it pertains to aid arts, um, as, as being able to uh, respond very flexibly and quickly. So DFA, FOS, right? So the acronyms, of course, always have to have our, our acronyms. Uh, so DFA, Direct Federal Assistance versus Federal Operational Support, right? Uh, so these are the two mission assignment types that are kind of written in. Um, the important one for us to know is the DFA, right? This is, this is uh, really where we fall into, but that doesn't mean that we uh, haven't done FOS mission assignments before. Uh, so really the differences are um, that the state initiates the request and outlines the need, right? So that's the state um, identifying what needs to be done in the area, uh, like in New Jersey. Uh, specifically, they didn't have any help. Uh, there was not really a lot of groups that were, you know, I think they said they had one group since we came in, we went in on in October. Uh, so for five weeks, they really only had one group helping folks out. So when we got there, um, it was uh, quite uh, quite the need and quite the staggering numbers to be able to to get through. Right, um, the cost shared, of course. So FEMA carries seventy five percent of the costs with twenty five with the state. And eight arts uh, service sponsors are the state and FEMA. So um, the state and FEMA really. Um, supervise us and um, they also work with us and support us. Um, but really, again, we want that buffer and so allow our folks on the ground to be able to do what um, we're best at doing. Uh, and ideally, we do have no contact with the, the state and FEMA, at least the eight arts shouldn't. Um, but service is mostly direct, but we could also do capacity building because that's what we're good at too. Um, so FOS, we have FEMA. It's like 100% FEMA, initiates the cost, carries all the cost, they're our service sponsor, uh, and it's all capacity building, no direct services allowable, right? So this is something that if they just are overwhelmed and they don't have the numbers, say they're really, um, really with uh, a lot of operations to that point, 
um, they're able to call us in and we can go in and we can support as like, I don't know, um, phone bank, uh, you know, just helping them with just people power uh, and be able to do it efficiently and proficiently. So we have our uh, AC team here, right? So a typical mission assignment will look like this, um, at least on paper. So we have the DSU mission assignment manager. <coughs> Excuse me. We have uh, our FEMA VALS and they work with um, our DSU mission assignment operations manager, right? So there is a distinction. We have the overall mission assignment manager from the DSU. Um, but then we have the one that's really overseeing the operations and will work directly and closely uh, with the disaster cadre who is selected. So at one time there may be two, right? So there may be a, a DSU manager, uh, but if it's a more complex operation that requires a little more support, there will be a cadre as well. Uh, and then of course the incident commander, right? So we have our IC. Uh, and then falling directly under that, um, we kind of have our, if necessary, support functions um, that can come into play. Uh, so we have our safety officer, public information officer, community liaison, program liaison, right? Um, and this is very scalable. So there may be folks that are wearing a lot of hats, depending on the nature of the response, or we have multiple people for each of these sections, right? Multiple members or staffs for multi, uh, for each of these sections. Um, there's opportunity if a member has proven themselves to be reliable and to be um, someone who's really up for the challenge uh, to fall into uh, this structure, right? So on our last response, we had AmeriCorps members as operations, planning and logistics, uh, but we if we have staff, um, we could see if there's, uh, you know, opportunity for them to take those as kind of like primary roles first. Um, but if they are, you know, more primarily a strike team, we will send them out. Um, and again, this is scalable. So, you know, at a smaller response, we might have three strike teams, but uh, at least in New Jersey, we, I think at one point had 11. Uh, which is pretty pretty intense um, in terms of thinking about each of those teams um, need to have a scheduled assignment for that day and the next and the next. Um, so we are we are pretty busy. So we had three operations chiefs, I think two planning, two logistics, and then we had a safety officer uh, as well because that is a lot of folks to manage and we need to make sure that everybody is being safe. Um, so this is to also eliminate, um, you know, kind of uh, what I talked about before, you know, when things just kind of get uh, muddled of everybody contacting one person. And this is really to streamline and just have one set role of communication or what set line of communication. It escalates up uh, always uh, and making sure that we're making um, reported and concise decisions, so. <clears throat> so some of our mission priorities, right? So it's at the direction of the mission assignment scope of work. Um, and usually that's pretty flexible, right? So we we write in uh, the MA scope of work uh, to be pretty vague. Um, does anybody want to take a guess at why we make our mission assignment scopes um, pretty vague? Either sound out or put your answer in the chat. Yes, absolutely. Yes, a couple answers in the chat. Um, it is to cover anything that we might do and flexibility. So if we write in something that is to the letter of the law, um, but we identify another need while we're on the ground, 
we're not going to be able to do that because all our dollars are saying that we are directly, um, let's say, in just pure mucking gutting, right? Um, but we identified a need to do some capacity building for uh, some BRCs in the area, but we can't do that because it's written into our mission assignment that we're there for mucking and gutting. So it would be a violation of that. Um, so yes, flexibility to do anything that we may need to do. So service functions and locations by um, area is going to be prior prioritized by FEMA and the state. So if they have any priority counties, they're going to let us know. Uh, and we are going to try and hit those um, first. Typically, uh, socially vulnerable populations um, are the ones uh, that we try to get to first. And then priority demographics. Um, so the people we try to help first, first responders, emergency management staff, and veterans. So another question, why do you guys think we try to help first responders uh, or emergency management staff first, or even veterans? Why are they considered a priority demographic? Yes, for sure. So they can help out. Um, exactly. And they're trained. Yeah, great answers there. Um, yeah, so, you know, a question that pops up, right? What if you have your emergency management staff, um, but their home has been affected and they have a family and it's a 100 degree day outside, but they don't know where to go. Are you expecting that individual to come into work when their family is essentially displaced? Um, you know, so when we go into an area, we want to make sure that we're helping those folks out first. Um, that they have their needs met uh, because they are trained in skills and they're ready for it, but there is not much. Um, not much you can do um, if you, you know, you don't have a home or if there are utilities that are out. Um, you're going to be thinking about your family and you need to make sure that they are um, taken care of as well. Um, and even extended family too. We had a couple folks. Um, during the derecho that was just like, I can't do that. You know, I have a uh, family in eastern Iowa that, uh, you know, my aunt and uncle who are here that I really need to make sure are, you know, taken care of. So it's not only immediate family, it's it extended and others as well. So, and of course, there are vulnerable populations that are going to be a little harder to recover um, just based on a variety of circumstances. So, So we're really getting into again our kind of bread and butter here. So our individual assistance services. Um, here we have a fantastic picture of someone getting suited up for what looks like mucking and gutting, uh, which really goes into uh, a lot of the the IA services, right? You have your PPE, your hard hat, respirator. Um, so some of the things that we can do. Um, some common support services that we play um, in disaster affected communities. Um, so we have mass care, of course, sheltering, feeding, distribution of life sustaining supplies like MREs or um, water or anything that's going to allow those folks to, to be OK for that day. Uh, health and wellness checks, so just making sure that folks um, okay not only physically but mentally that is a big proponent of what we do as well um, making sure that we're giving folks um, access to services that they need um, of course that direct service uh, the most fun uh, access to property right so if there's a tree on their yard or uh, stuff that's just been absolutely blown into their property um, making sure that folks have access back to their property um, protection of property, which includes emergency roof tarping, uh, mucking and gutting, emergency mold suppression, um, and emergency home repairs, right? So again, the, uh, you know, there's a variety of ways that that stuff can, can drop. And obviously a lot of our eight arts um, are composed of uh, conservation cores, which are just land stewardship pro programs. Uh, and are typically uh, chainsaw trained and certified, uh, so they're able to go in that uh, go in there. 
uh, and be able to provide um, those services. I would also sound out that we have, if you are interested, um, one of our own national service programs here in Iowa um, have a Chainsaw Safety and 101 Use uh, Academy. Uh, so if anybody is interested in that, uh, please, I'll drop my information in the chat later and I'll send out uh, another email. Um, but if you are interested in uh, par participating in that, um, please let me know and we can get you um, a little trained up on, on how to do that. Uh, volunteer management services. So we have a uh, course. Um, a lot of what we do is participating in the VRC. I think this is a photo from Joplin. Pretty sure. Um, but the VRC, right? So uh, what we talked about before, uh, it's a space where spontaneous volunteers can go into and they could register uh, and get their work documented. Um, those those crucial volunteer hours. Um, we're also able to provide kind of just a very just in time training for folks, right? So if we have volunteers that want to be a part of the VRC, we're able to get trained and then train them, right? That's a big skill set of ours. We're looked at uh, in the disaster world as leaders of, of volunteer management. So we have database management like homeowner, in, uh, homeowner intake and volunteer forms, uh, damage assessments, and uh, again, tracking those volunteer hours. Like I said, field uh, leadership for volunteers, we know how to be safe. Um, sometimes, you know, volunteers can get a little ahead of themselves. They get a little uh, little uh, excited because it is an exciting place to be, right? You want to help, you're ready to go. Um, sometimes folks show up in flip-flops, right, in tank tops, and they're like, I'm ready to, you know, chainsaw at that tree. I'm like, no, you're not. Uh, you, need, you need the proper equipment. Uh, and also proper clothing and attire and uh, proper PPE, right? So just being able to be there and support volunteers in the field and making sure that folks are staying safe. Of course, you know, we're never going to be um, 100%, uh, but uh, just mitigating and being aware of risks that are around us are, are very important. So uh, we also do some uh, supporting of uh, housing, volunteer housing and logistics. So finding where some folks may be. Um, typically folks sleep in churches. I've slept in all types of places, um, including church attics, basements. Um, you know, uh, lately it's been children's camps, uh, which has actually been like five star lodging as far as eight art uh, housing goes. Uh, it's, it's actually a lot of fun. We can also do donation management services, which include warehouse support, uh, points of distribution and donations tracking. Um, I, who was the individual that was at Joplin? Do you want to talk a little bit about what you, um, what you did there specifically, and kind of what you saw other volunteers doing? If you're able to unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm yeah. Gonna be honest, I'm back in school. <laughs> so it's, it's been a hot minute since I've been there. Um, most of what we were doing was kind of like cleanup of the neighborhoods. And then um, we had found a homeowner whose house had had, it was hit by the tornado, but not fully destroyed. And then when he came back to try to um, work on it, he found out that like a bunch of people had stolen all the copper wires out of it. So um, he was really needing a lot of help. And so we helped him um, kind of rebuild his house and then um, did a little bit of like disaster cleanup. There's a lot of like debris all over the place um, is mostly what I remember. Michael, are you muted? Oh, yes, I was muted. I'm so sorry. 
Um, yeah, <laughs> I just went off. Well, I was just saying donations, management services. We've done warehousing support. Uh, we've done points of distribution in the past and donations tracking. Uh, donations can really be a nightmare if you let it be. Um, and it can really, really sneak up on you. Uh, one of the trainings that I attended, uh, even in really unusual circumstances, right? So if anybody remembers uh, the Sandy Hook tragedy, um, they were, that really became a disaster and a disaster because there were so many um, just donations that were piling into that community that they really needed to ask for support. Um, and I also said thank you for sharing that anecdote um, and was saying how time flies of 2011 uh, feeling like it was yesterday, but it's been like 10 years. So <laughs> uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, so we have public assistance services, which include critical debris removal, um, also flood fighting, sandbagging, uh, dispatch and tracking of donated equipments and park and public restoration. Um, yeah, so critical debris removal is really kind of our bread and butter here as well. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean just private, you know, private property like an individual's property as well. Um, we've done things for the, the city um, to where we've uh, really cleared essential roadways uh, and um, just public facilities that they needed uh, to just allow them to, you know, be able to operate on a, a better level. Um, it's, uh, it's always interesting to see how catastrophic, um, you know, debris can really be, and we have a, a little exercise later of, of identifying that stuff. Um, but yes, so community outreach services. So this is a really big part. Um, like I said, we have people power as um eight arts right something that we do have is just a lot of members uh so damage and other needs assessments this is actually my favorite as well um being able to go out and talk with homeowners and be able to assess their needs and to to figure out really what they um what they what they have um sustained in terms of damage and uh, what we're able to provide them right so even when we go to talk to some of these folks and you know supporting 211 or call centers and tracking their intake um we're able to take the direct service information that potentially we're able to help with but we can also provide um really long lasting uh, effects like having that information documented for case management or being able to provide them other services or resources that are necessary, right? So if you are in a conversation and you really are kind of worried about potentially this person's mental health, um, you're able to pass off some resources that they can contact uh, to be able to get that, that help and support that they desperately need, right? Uh, we've supported MARCs before, which are multi-agency resource centers uh, if you picture it just kind of like a market, like a one stop shop uh, for everything that a survivor could potentially need in terms of resources. Uh, we've done transportation, logistics support um, and staffing and of course canvassing. Um, and we always wear uh, these beautiful. If you participate, you know, you can get one. These beautiful eight art high vis vests uh, that are mandatory. Uh, when we go out on a response. Um, I know that Les and Naomi, I think, are on here. If you wanted to talk a little bit about your experience um, in disaster, doing damage assessments and being out in the field. OK, so when me and Les were in New Jersey, um we went to the people's houses we assessed what they needed like what kind of damage was going on how they were doing there were a few people that we gave um like i'm uh, sorry i'm not remembering right but like emergency services numbers like for mental health checks and things like that um yeah it was 
It was really hard sometimes talking to the people and seeing what they've gone through, but it was also very rewarding knowing that we were able to gonna go get them help. That's awesome, Naomi, thank you. Yeah, so it's, you know, it's um, like Naomi said, I think that it's important to realize that these are tough situations to be in, but um, it's also going to be one of the most rewarding experiences um, of your life. Um, and I very much cherish every disaster that I've been a part of. Um, I, you never know when you're going to be able to have that opportunity again. Um, so really when you're in it, I try to hammer home to all of the members to even um, in some tough times and some stressful times to really embrace it and to have some perspective of, of what we're doing because it really does matter and it's very important. So some examples of capacity building services, right? Um, so we support uh, emergency management. So any emergency managers across the state that may need our help, um, they could give us a call and we can potentially help them in some sort of fashion. Uh, BOAD, so we have our own uh, very active BOAD here, uh, which are voluntary organizations active in disaster uh, and a co-ed network, but uh, which is the Iowa Disaster Human Resource Council, which is comprised of many organizations that are willing and able to help uh, in the event of a disaster. And we try to better um, Iowa's response and resource capabilities, right? And co-ads essentially do that on a very smaller scale in, our, in their local community. Uh, and then of course, after the fact, we need folks that are gonna be helping the folks um, that um, did not unfortunately receive assistance during that primary response phase, which include long term recovery groups. Um, we can support an interagency facilitation. So being able to have that um, that communication and being able to provide that surge capacity for staffing, uh, especially if there's like an organization with just a couple folks um, and you know they need just more people to man phones or to uh, assist with individuals, survivors coming in. We're able to uh, provide that surge capacity for staffing. <clears throat> and when I was with Habitat, um, I would call in uh, just as a, a regular non-governmental organization, an NGO. Um, I would call into our state ad calls and kind of give them an update of where we were um, and in kind of managing our own resources and our disaster teams during the derecho. So uh, we primarily worked in Marshalltown, of course, because that's where we were located. Uh, but then through our calls, uh, we were able to identify other needs. Um, so just good to have that communication and be able to provide that support when necessary. So some partners uh, that we typically work with, we talked a little bit about them, right? Um, and some not so much. So Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, of course, we talked about them. Uh, the US Army Corps of Engineers, uh, they usually get called in um, with all things floods, right? Um, but they all are also able to, to help um, with kind of some emergency repair. Uh, which include like tarping and tarping supplies. But with all things floods, um, that's typically where they come in. Um, and they also uh, have uh, blue roof tarping stock if necessary. Um, and we'll assist them in, if called upon, right, to be able to maybe do warehousing or housing or that direct service. So. Um, the American Red Cross, some of you may be familiar with, right? Um, typically responsible for mass care. Um, they, they have their own MOUs with uh, memorandums of understanding with FEMA and uh, they kind of act independently, but we sometimes will provide assistance um, in kind of that storage capacity and that um, distribution of life sustaining supplies with them, right? Uh, and then our national voluntary agency, right? So on our state level, we have our VOAD, but then we have the national one that kind of oversees all of them. Uh, so it's the organizing body, uh, if you will, for the, the organizations that are involved with the VOADs. Uh, and a big thing um, 
with them are the four C's, right? So cooperation, communication, coordination, and collaboration. Um, typically, that that is uh, the foundation of everything that we do. Um, and we try to embody that uh, and also make sure that others that are associated with us embody that as well. So I'm going to take a sip of water and then we'll dive into disaster response partners, state and local. Does anybody have any questions so far? Any responses? Hearing none, I will just keep on trucking along. Uh, so we do have a question. So do ADAR teams follow FEMA guidelines on who to serve? For example, if it's someone's second home, FEMA can assist even if the person who lives there isn't the homeowner. Would strike teams be able to uh, help the inhabitant repair their roof? Um, yeah, so it's it's interesting, right? So if that is their primary home at the time, um, it's it's up to conversation. Typically, you know, if they're if they're not home and that's their second home, um, we we might not. Um, it's really dependent on kind of what get gets written in. Um, but we have kind of our own guidelines and we'll we'll go up the chain of command if that is something that we are um, unsure about. But typically we do try to help everybody. Um, Right, and if that is their the home that they are living in currently, and they can't get out of that area, of course we're going to do it. Um, we don't have any federal restrictions really um, that will prevent us from doing that. I think like FEMA, um, because it's written in. We talked about that flexibility because it's written into our mission assignment that we're there to tarp roofs. Right, we're going to tarp a roof. Like if we have the supply, we're going to do it. It's better for the community in general. Um, if that was if that was me and I was on the grounds and that person was living there at the time and they had gone through the storm, I would say we're going to help them. Um, but if they're out of state and that's their home, I think I would have to follow that up with my uh, DSU manager to see what we're going to do in that in that because um, a lot of programs do have it written in that if it's their second home, we, we typically can't assist. I hope that answers uh, your question. Uh, so disaster response partners, so we talked a little bit about this, state service commissions, uh, state and local EMAs, right? We have other um, national service programs. We partner with United Way and 211 a lot. Uh, during the derecho, the United Way was pretty instrumental in bringing us in, uh, and by us, I mean Habitat for Humanities mobile response teams at Eastern Iowa. Um, they were kind of the, the open door um, to let us get into that community, right? So we always want to make sure that we're welcome and we're not stepping on any toes wherever we go. Um, and every one of these organizations too are allow, will really allow us that cultural awareness, that community awareness on getting information out into the community, but also understanding where we are in the community. Um, and of course, long-term recovery committees and groups, if they've already been established, um, we're, uh, and even if they haven't been, uh, we're able to take all the information that we have collected through our MA um, and be able to uh, send that to them. Uh, so they are in a fantastic place um, before we, we even leave, right? So our impact is not only response, but of course recovery, and that's why our documentation is so important and is so crucial. Uh, so we have a quick slide on just DSU expectations, right? Um, so safety first, always. That is mine as well. Um, you know, that is that is just something that we cannot uh, overlook, especially when going into hazardous situations. Uh, we talked about the ACT. Uh, so always communicate up the chain, right? So, you know, we don't want uh, a member who's uh, asking about dinner for the night to contact uh, the FEMA. Um, gosh, what was he? This is a real situation. The member contacted the FEMA, one of the FEMA heads, 
uh, and that was not great. <laughs> Uh, that was that was a really interesting situation, and that was during uh, hurricane one of the hurricanes, I believe. Um, so we always want to communicate out the chain chain of command. Maybe ask your team lead what's for dinner, not you know one of the people that are writing our checks. Uh, satisfy reporting requirements, so we always report back uh, to the DSU of everything that we did. Uh, and that just uh, not only lets your program kind of be um, highlighted as what we've done, um, but it also allows FEMA to know uh, exactly the impact that we're doing for the state. Uh, one aid art together, right? So you see everybody with these beautiful vests that have not been updated. Um, mm -hmm. And we have so many of. Um, we are all under the A. So whenever we're on a response, although we are many organizations, we are all just one AmeriCorps disaster response team. Uh, and that really allows for, uh, you know, mitigation of confusion, but also a lot of camaraderie and teamwork, right? Um, and always making sure we're branded. Um, talked a little bit about uh, in that example, um, about how in, in Joplin writes, Leah had said that the copper wire was stolen from that house to be sold, probably. Um, we always wanna be branded because there's always gonna be folks that are misrepresenting themselves or have malicious intent. And we wanna make sure that we are um, upholding those expectations, right? Um, okay, so I have, a little thing here, right? So I wanted to show an example of kind of some direct service. Yeah, lots of looting usually after um, an event um, in Southwest Iowa and Pacific Junction. Um, homes had particle board or ply plywood, right? Um, with uh, spray painted, just like, you know, looters go away. There's nothing in here. Um, people see this opportunity to price gouge as well. We had, you know, people go in with generators into an affected area and they sell them for thousands of dollars, even though it's, uh, you know, uh, probably like a crap $100 generator somewhere. Um, so it's things to look out for. That's why it's so important that we, we really uphold ourselves. So, uh, I'm going to go ahead and try this. So this is an individual that we helped in New Jersey. I'm just uh, forewarning you guys that this is, um, you know, pretty uh, heavy stuff. Uh, but one of the guys that we ended up helping uh, was a newscaster. We had no idea. He was a, an incredibly nice guy. Uh, his name was Eric Landskroner. Um, and this was after Hurricane Ida. Uh, they just bought this house a couple weeks prior. Um, they had just finished their basement. They haven't touched any of the other house. Um, and it was completely destroyed. The foundation was just shot. Um, you could see how high the water line went in their home. Uh, this is about seven inches of mud, I think, in his basement. Uh, some pretty incredible stuff. He um, basically built this basement as like a, a testament to his kids of like their dream basement he had a bunch of collectibles he loved star wars uh and disney so uh and you could see we kind of started um and from this muck if you can see where the shovel is that is still muck under there that is still stuff that needs to be cleaned out um and the extent of black mold is pretty um pretty intense so let's put that away and this is after, All right? So we have clean floors, clean studs, right? So this is what we call um, repair ready. Um, so it's all of this is cleaned out. It's been sprayed with uh, mold suppression items. We have our folks in full muck and gut gear. Um, but this is one of the highlights of my time in New Jersey. It was one of the most um, intense homes that we had. Uh, and these guys got it done in about a week. And if you could see, you could see how badly the foundation uh, had gotten caved in and how much um, really uh, the damage of Hurricane Ida had affected this home. But um the homeowner was incredibly thankful he really uh he got displaced of course because utilities weren't able to um 
go back to the home and uh, after our work, they were able to return to their home for the first time in a couple weeks, um, if not a month or two. So um, I just wanted to show you guys that as an example, and I have a couple others later on as well. So that's the end of our section here. We do have um, an activity coming up, but I want to break for um, any questions, reflections, or anything that anybody would like um, to sound out on. And I think it's been an hour um, since we last took a break, so why don't we go ahead and take a five minute break and we'll come back to the activity. So at 10.05, uh, we'll come back. So everybody go grab another cup of coffee, use the restroom stretch if you need to.
Alrighty. So let's dive back into it. Five after. Um, this photo actually has a few Iowa folk. Um, so we have some past Conservation Corps of Minnesota, Iowa. Uh, we have a current program manager here, and then we have a um, past volunteer Iowa employee um, that uh, participated in several disasters too, and a couple legacy folks from Texas Conservation Corps. Washington Conservation Corps. Um, and this was the last convening uh, that we were able to have uh, in person, uh, so it was a pretty big thing. Uh, and obviously with COVID the last couple of years, we haven't been able to, to do anything like that since. Um, but old logo. All right, so we have an activity here. Um, the last time we did this, it was a lot of fun actually. And uh, it did work, so I'm hoping that it will work this time, but I need a couple brave souls. We'll do a couple of them uh, unless we get into it and we want to do all of them, but I need uh, someone to unmute themselves um, or a couple folks, and we're going to do a little bit of Jeopardy based on what we just learned. So uh, do I have a volunteer uh, to go out there? Michael, Michael, I can be, I your, can volunteer. be your volunteer. Okay. All right. Go for it. <laughs> Let's, do Let's do National, National Service and Service Disaster, Disaster for 100. for 100. Okay. So this office is responsible for coordinating AmeriCorps and National Service and Disaster. If you, if you guys know. Uh, what is DSU? Oh, <laughs> sorry. I thought I had to answer. My bad. No, it's okay. <laughs> Uh, do we so just say it out loud or do we need to raise our hand? You can say it out loud, yeah. Okay. Say it out loud or if you guys would like uh, to put your answer in the chat, you're more than welcome to. But Katie nailed it on the head. What is the Disaster Services Unit or the DSU? Um, so do we have a brave volunteer, someone else? Be bold. Let's play some Jeopardy. This is Riley, I'll go. All right, go for um, it, Riley. Let's, let's do support services for 100. Sheltering, feeding, and distribution of life-saving supplies are three examples of this. So if you guys know it, shout it out or put it in the chat. Riley, do you know it? I don't. <laughs> So we had talked a little bit about the kind of Red Cross um, kind of being leaders of this. Does anybody have a guess in the chat? Anybody want to speak up? Way to go, Claire, yes. Mass care. Although, yes, it does fall under that as well, Hillary. So, <clears throat> all right, maybe let's do one more. Who wants to be a brave soul here? Oh, yep. <laughs> All right, why don't we do why don't we just click on uh, support services for 200 and we'll see what the $200 question is. Uh, this is the most often used structure that unaffiliated unaffiliated spontaneous volunteers are managed. Right, so we talked a little bit about how aid arts um, may be able to support this in kind of like a surge capacity if folks are really coming into uh, an area. Yeah, correct, Greg. What is a volunteer reception center? 
right? So this is where we try to funnel spontaneous volunteers into uh, and make sure that they are registered and um, not potentially causing any harm to the community that we're trying to serve. Alrighty, I'll do one more and then we can continue on. So anybody want to sound out or I'll just go ahead and do mission management 100. Okie dokie. So the AmeriCorps command structure was created and used to provide better blank across all blank branches of national service. Who has a guess? We talked a little bit about this with the four C's. So that is very close, Hillary. I'm sorry. It was coordination. It was one of the C's, but you did nail a C. That is very, very good. Um, so. <laughs> yeah, complete. Yeah, definitely compliance. <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> uh yeah so thank you guys i really appreciate it so we'll just go uh through them so the office responsible for coordinating of course oh john wants to play all right okay fimo 101 300 individual assistance and public assistance are the two categories of assistance this is one that provides support to disaster survivors Who has an answer? Between it's 50 50, you got either individual assistance or public assistance. Which one is the one that provides support to disaster survivors? So it is that individual assistance, right? So very uh, cut and dry when it comes to this. Uh, when it's individual assistance, we really are supporting the individual. When it's public assistance, we're supporting more um, of those uh, of like organizations and um, public service kind of structures, right? Uh, so we had the DSU. Nash, uh, 1995, this was the first use of national service in a disaster response, and that was the Oklahoma City bombing. This response was notable for saving the city and state $17.8 million in federal cost share, and that was Joplin, Missouri. The federal agency is responsible for providing training, technical assistance, funding, and operation coordination for all federal disasters. That's FEMA. Emergency declaration is one of two types of uh, federal disaster declarations, right? And that is a major federal disaster declaration. What is? And we just went over this one, and that is individual assistance. Again, to better coordination across all branches of national service and ACT, AmeriCorps command team. Uh, and then AmeriCorps disaster cadre and eight arts are deployed by the DSU under this mechanism. And what is a FEMA mission assignment? We went through mass care. And we went through the VRC. And of course, we just went through this example. This home needs this support service. And through that IA that is mucking and gutting. very very clear where we go in and we muck everything out we get rid of all that gunk and then we gut the home to allow them to get to a place to be able to rebuild and repair so appreciate you guys hanging tough with me on that again this is going to be module two understanding stress and disaster psychology has anybody 
um, have any questions or anything that has popped into their mind from the last module that they want to touch base on before I continue. OK, hearing none, we could just dive into it. And if you have anything, please feel free to throw it in the chat. Uh, so for module two, we're going to do um, a couple units, uh, and I hope to be done by noon. Um, unit four, understanding stress, and then unit five, disaster psychology and impacts, right? So by the end of this module, you'll be able to understand disaster, uh, distress and survivors and responders, and then common stressors while on deployment. You're going to be able to identify and explain that, and then you're going to be able to utilize self-care methods to manage your own and support others experiencing disaster. So unit four, understanding stress. So what is stress? We're going to go over it. Stress causes and symptoms, stress resistance, resilience, and self-care. Uh, and then in the participant guide um, that was sent out to all program managers. Uh, so if you're a member and you want to um, take a look at that, the participant guide has a lot of self-care activities that we'll touch on, um, but it's really up to you to fill out and to understand kind of your own. Um, so we'll understand causes of stress and impacts the mental, physical, and emotional health, identify symptoms of stress, understand self-care benefits and methods. And then, like I said, uh, we have a self-care plan activity uh, that's in the participant guide. Uh, we won't be doing it together today. Maybe we'll have a little bit of a discussion, um, but uh, by the end of this, you'll be able to create and use a self-care plan. So overview of stress, we'll talk about how it impacts people differently, uh, how it shows up as symptoms, um, and really what it is, right? So we'll start out with what is stress. Uh, we have a little bit of a curve here, um, something that we, we hear a lot about, right? We talk a lot about, it's described as something toxic. Um, however, they describe stress as a spectrum, right? From one end of the scale to that lame phase, uh, all the way to the disease phase. And we really want to avoid, um, <clears throat> obviously, this section. That's when we end up with exhaustion, panic, anxiety, anger, burnout, and breakdown. Um, but we do have kind of like a peak performance phase where we're in between these two. Um, does anybody want to put in the chat or sound out what some examples of maybe positive stress might be um, something that could be healthy um, that will allow you know stress not to fall into this disease phase but uh, an example of maybe uh, healthy stress <laughs> Sarah that was a good one <laughs> uh, yes, Aaron, uh, great example, exciting and fun projects for sure. Uh, they like to describe that kind of as being like in the zone. So say you have a, um, a deadline coming up, right? Uh, I know that I work better when I have uh, some set structures of dates. Uh, so it just keeps me motivated and focused. Um, describe it as kind of optimum stress levels. You never want to be bored, obviously. Um, it's a it's a different side of lethargicism and uh, not being able to provide yourself um, with the functions that you you really need. Um, I would say that here, um, <clears throat> around here, from fatigued. Um, but focused and optimum stress, uh, that's usually where we fall under in um, uh, disaster deployments, right? Um, exactly, practicing for disasters, high energy activities, but not real disasters. Um, it'll keep you focused, but you will be tired, uh, but we really wanna 
kind of play a teeter-totter um, on this and making sure that we're not falling into anything that could potentially harm our members or ourselves. Uh, but really, what causes stress, right? Uh, literally anything. Um, folks have different, um, you know, different things that stress them out. Uh, it could be very particular, uh, but it could also be pretty universal. But everything really does cause stress. Uh, and whether that's good or not is just how we um, kind of input uh, that stimuli uh, and process it and uh, through our own experience, utilize it to either, um, you know, really hammer home a project or potentially it can cause us some harm, right? So we have some examples of stress here. Some folks are, you know, stressed out at public speaking. Um, Hillary put in that, you know, the dating. Yeah, dating is stressful too. Uh, having a deadline coming up that maybe you didn't prepare for. Uh, that's pretty stressful. I know that I hate traffic being from New York City uh, and you get stuck in traffic all the time. Um, it's a good thing here in Iowa that doesn't ever really happen. Um, but that is also a stressor. Some people are afraid of dogs. Um, and then I don't know if anybody, so I, I offered this up with our last group. Anybody have an idea of what this stress stressor is on the top left because we could not figure it out. So if anybody wants to sound out in the chat of what they think the stressor could be, we thought uh, intricacy was maybe the answer. Like being, yeah, it could be being stuck in the suburbs, getting lost potentially, yeah. I think getting, I think lost. getting lost. Getting lost, yeah. Although I do agree with suburbs. I Yeah, I really appreciate that. <laughs> uh being the house without the pool that's a tough place to be it seems like all those neighbors decided not to you know um not to have that but yes falling into the oodles of pools that could also be it you know maybe if you're you're hopping your ferris bueller in some backyards uh you're you're stressed out about potentially falling into some pools um I hope all the members understood uh, Ferris Bueller, but who knows? Uh, it could also be a fear of drones. Yeah, that could be drones. All right. Thank you guys for that. Uh, I would say that the suburbs also definitely stress me out as well. It's too quiet. I don't trust it. Uh, you know, I need I need some noise. Um, but OK. Uh, stress symptoms. Yeah, nosy neighbors. Fear no privacy ever. So symptoms may be um, only one or a few early in the sick phase, but increase as we go on. So we want to make sure that we're trying to take some steps to mitigate this uh, and ensuring that we don't get to a point uh, where we may be a harm uh, uh, to ourselves or others, right? Um, there's always different pivots that potentially we can we can find uh, and be able to help our peers. And if not, we could also um, send them out to uh, professionals that'll be able to help them as well, right? Uh, so some symptoms uh, pop up. Um, psychologically, we have some negative self-talk, right? Those intrusive thoughts, um, not being able to stop those, a lot of self-doubt. Um, cognitively, inability to remember a reason. Uh, confused or inability to concentrate, right? So you just can't figure out uh, the task at hand. Um, and then emotional behavior symptoms, easily angered, anxious, sad, irritable, depressed, tense, or nervous, right? And all of these things are um, really dependent on the individual and their past experience in their life. What may be stressful for one person may be exciting for the other. Uh, and what one person may overcome as a stressful situation the you know the other individual may succumb to that situation so uh it all depends and we really want to be mindful of uh just identifying these um these things because it you know, disaster response is inherently stressful um and uh, the more time that you're in there uh in a response uh the more likely you are to become stressed um and just being it being in that area, seeing the things that uh, potentially that we see um, can manifest in different ways. So uh, physically, 
unable to sleep or sleeping too much. Uh, the physicals are hard because we do have like certain situations um, where, you know, like we we sleep on really uncomfortable cots and you're it's really hard to sleep and that could, you know, really build up stress. Uh, if you grind your teeth, maybe jaw pain or if it um, pops up in different ways like headaches or muscle tension, right? Um, stomach or digestive problems. Um, it's important to just understand ourselves and what uh, we're bringing into in, uh, that situation to begin with um, and making sure that we're covered with our own self-care tactics. So, and again, we'll talk a little bit about that later and what that preparedness kind of looks like and how we can, how we can do. So uh, just managing stress, we'll be discussing, uh, managing and reducing stress, we'll be discussing this, uh, some stress resilience and resistance and some self-care planning and practice. Um, here we have some, uh, you know, a good example. Uh, if you practice meditation or yoga, that's definitely a great way to uh, potentially reduce some stress. Um, we want to make sure that we're identifying this stuff, right? So uh, there's a lot of different factors. Um, some people have stress, resilience, and resistance to a high degree. Uh, and just being able to let stress kind of like roll off your back um, with little or to no impact, but others um, may not be as may not be so lucky and uh, you know stress resilient. You're able to recover quickly from a disrupting event like if something like that has happened. Um, you know you have a lot of endurance uh, to endure right to that hardship and be able to to move past it. But uh, these are some key qualities and some factors uh, that contribute to stress resilience and resistance, right? So if you have some supportive networks, um, so if you have those trusting relationships where you're able to speak very open and vulnerably, um, that's always really great. It's not good to internalize kind of our issues and, and bottle them deep because they will come out in, in a variety of different symptoms and ways, right? Um, having a sense of control um, where you just have that belief where you have uh, control over many aspects um, of the the issues that are causing you stress um, general attitude we really preach this before going into a response um, that flexibility is really key uh, and just having a positive attitude and trying to roll with the punches um, will really take you a long way uh, because every day on disaster is, is very different. Um, and we have a saying, if you've been through one disaster, you've been through one disaster, right? So every disaster has its own inherent unique challenges um, and situations that you may have to overcome. And being able to have a positive attitude through that uh, is something that is, is really crucial. So uh, emotional control, also being able to diagnose your own stress symptoms pretty quickly. Uh, and figuring out how you can activate your self-care plans. Um, you know, I, I always preach to our members that if you need to walk off site uh, to cool off, you know, if you just need a second um, or even a minute or even a day to just let us know, um, it's better to be open and honest than letting things fester. Uh, and then potentially, you know, where we reach a situation where we have to send somebody home. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to never have to do that. Um, we have come pretty close a couple times just for, um, you know, some some stress reasons and other reasons. Um, but that is our really our last um, our last hope and desire is to send anybody home uh, for an experience uh, that we really want them to get a lot out of. But it has happened. Um, you know we have some stricter guidelines and regulations on disaster now like no uh no alcohol no drinking um of course no drugs um and sometimes folks uh break the rules and they they get sent home so uh so <clears throat> we have a little bit of uh this self-care plan uh building activity um, so really, we have covered all aspects uh, in here of what uh, self-care may look like. Um, if you want to sound out or put it in the chat, um, 
what you guys think each bubble may be as it pertains to a self-care activity. The bottom, the bottom right looks right. like it's like activity, physical stress relieving, you know, exercise. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. And when we when we do go on a response, we are very tired, but we do try to, um, you know, really uh, encourage folks to get out and be a little active. Um, our teams in New Jersey used to do Frisbee every day afterwards. <laughs> yeah, <that's a> <laughs> uh, yes, I I would agree with both of those answers, Michaela and Leah. <laughs> uh, art is a great way to de-stress. Uh, we had many folks uh, go out and buy journals. I always encourage folks to get journals uh, and document kind of their experience. Um, Maybe paint is a little <laughs> is a little messy uh, for a response, but uh, you know, finger painting's all right too. Uh, eating healthy, yes. Uh, so we do try to encourage that while we're on response because uh, you know a, a healthy body is a good body, and if you're eating junk, you're probably going to feel like junk. It doesn't, it's not as, it doesn't go well, Michaela. It doesn't go well, I promise you. As an art teacher, I've seen, I've seen folks try and do it. It's not great. Haley, <laughs> they look like that guy. <laughs> All right. Uh, I appreciate uh, everybody jumping in, um, being a part of that. Uh, so we have uh, a little bit of a self-care plan, building activity, right? Um, but mainly, uh, like we had talked about um, before, um, it's in uh, your participant guide, right? Uh, on page 169, if you want to go into that, um, they have self-guided activities that allow you guys to really start building the foundation of what self-care planning activities are. Uh, so you could avoid being like that guy and probably uh, went to Michael's and was just like, I need a de-stress, right? Um, maybe if he had done a self-care building activity, he wouldn't have been uh, slopping paint with a mechanical pencil everywhere. He would have had a little more of an organized uh, plan of action there. but. Um, we do have that activity in the back. Uh, go ahead and take a look um, afterwards when you're able to. Um, I think, uh, why don't we take a second uh, in lieu of the activity um, to maybe if folks want to drop what um, some activities uh, for them uh, that are kind of stress relievers um, that they do in their your own personal life um that you feel comfortable sharing I, I would love to hear some i myself um i love cooking that's a big de-stressor for me i like the mechanicalness of being able to you know provide myself something yummy um but i also really love movies uh i recently just showed my partner every single lord of the rings movie um the extended version so that was quite uh quite the endeavor so that's usually some big de-stressors for me um, I do love sleeping as well, Aaron. That is that is so great to get uh, eight to ten hours of sleep. Hiking, yes. Cooking. I would say I recently just started trying to bake. I was never a good baker, and it. Uh, I wouldn't say it's going terribly. But it's definitely fun to try something new with uh, with uh, no um, kind of no fear there. I agree with you, Elizabeth. And as you guys are putting these in here, I do want you to keep in mind what you guys are saying, um, because later we'll talk about what this means on disaster, right? If we're able to, like Sarah, you put animal snuggles. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you put animal snuggles uh, it's, 
if you get sent out somewhere, potentially you won't be able to have that. Although we do have, I should have provided some pictures, uh, therapy dogs that we try to get out uh, whenever we're on a response. Uh, they're not ready. It's, uh, my my results are not ready for the office yet, Jesse. That is not um, something I think I can provide as a disaster program officer to this point. Uh, I think in the near future, potentially, maybe the next grant cycle, uh, we'll have a blueberry crumble. <laughs> Yes, and dancing. Um, we are one of our crews in New Jersey uh, used to do a dance party once a week, and we also had a bonfire once a week to where we would uh, we would also do a little bit of dancing. Um, and napping, napping is so crucial. We used to have uh, cots in our incident command post uh, because some folks would be really busy at certain points of the day, and then other times you have a lot of downtime and you are working so hard that it is napping is so crucial. I'm a big fan of naps. Uh, OK, so uh, like we talked about, right? Um, new habits take time. Trying new things takes time, right? Um, it's always it's never too late to try something uh, new and to figure out, uh, you know, what what you can be good at. Um, that stuff takes time though start small don't think you have to build rome in a day right um but it really goes a long way with increasing stress resistance and resilience um right like i was uh i was never into being able to really manage plants i am now a proud proud owner of like six plants and it's i think it's pretty therapeutic to think about their watering cycles and uh, stuff like that. Although the next time I go on disaster, they'll probably all die, which is not great. But, um, but really turned turned that into the foundation of what you're able to do, right? Um, even if it is art, if it's if it's dancing, if it's um, you know, hiking, there's always opportunities whenever we're on a response or um, responding to a you know a disaster locally or nationally. Uh, and practice makes better, not perfect, right? So the more we do it, uh, the better we are. And built slowly over time, um, it'll it'll really go a long way in, in helping us out. Um, but even if we're not successful one day, we could be successful the next day. And that is really true for a disaster. All right, so questions, reflections, anything that you guys want to bring up from this unit before we go on to unit five? Cool, cool, cool. All right. Well, I appreciate everybody's participation so far. Uh, we're going to continue on um, disaster psychology and impacts unit five. Um, this is always a fun one, um, just being able to discuss and talk about um, how to not only better, you know, identify some things in yourself, but also identify some things in your peers that can definitely help um, so unit five overview psychological disaster impacts survivor impacts and how to provide help uh, we'll go over a little bit about some to do's and not to do's uh, responder impacts and self-care we'll keep hitting on that self-care aspect and of course in a safe space when self-care isn't enough uh, what to do and some resources that we're able to provide um, and we'll dive into that a little bit later. So by the end of this unit, you'll be able to understand disaster distress in survivors and responders, identify and apply helpful actions to assist survivors, self-care measures to mitigate compassion fatigue, um, know and utilize other resources when needed. So psychological impacts, trauma, stressors, symptoms, right? So we talked a little bit about Joplin and how some of those homes were completely destroyed, right? Um, imagine being the owner of that home and, you know, your entire life um, was in there in terms of your valuables and, and now you have to figure out what to do, right? Or uh, your home was affected by a hurricane and it was completely thrown off its foundation and now it's on top of your car. Um, 
these are real photos and real situations of things that have happened and we have to understand and uh, be mindful of them. So some uh, direct um, aspects of it would be seeing, hearing and experiencing traumatic events personally, right? So if you have gone through that disaster um, or are in that area and then secondarily seeing the impact of it, maybe it's on the news, hearing about traumatic events from others uh, can lead to some some um, group trauma and it can also lead to some compassion fatigue. You know, we can only give so much um, and it can be difficult to continue to be empathetic, right? We also have to take care of ourselves because if we're not able to take care of ourselves, we're not able to take care of others. And then, of course, these can prevent themselves uh, psychologically. Um, as anger, uh, fear of reoccurrence, right? So those anniversaries can potentially um, trigger uh, some some bad emotions, denial. Um, and then physical, eating too much, uh, too little, uh, headaches, chain, and uh, headaches, chest pain. Um, so they can present themselves in a variety of different ways. Um, also increased self-medication rates. Um, Folks respond to trauma and to situations differently. Uh, we're not here to judge. Uh, we're just here um, to help, right? So this is definitely one of my favorite activities. Um, I want you guys, uh, since in person we can't do this, right? Uh, but I want you guys to think of one of each of these. Right, so uh, think of a blue card, uh, which, you know, it's a goal or opportunity, a uh, white card, which includes one of your favorite belongings, and then a pink card, uh, an activity or a hobby. Um, I want you guys to think about them, have them in your head. I'll give you, let's say, like two minutes, uh, and then I would love for some folks to share. So again, just pick, if you'd like to write them down, you can, but just pick one of each of these, right? So one blue, one white, one pink. Come up with what those answers are in your head or write them out. And then we're gonna discuss. All right, with a couple minutes passed, if anybody would like to share uh, a goal or opportunity, one of their favorite belongings, and either an activity or hobby that they enjoy, you can put them in the chat. Or if you feel so uh, bold to sound them out, um, I had put uh, student loans, uh, photos, and running. So my goal would be to pay off my student loans. Um, my uh, one of my favorite belongings are my photo albums, um, a, a collection of just prints and Polaroids uh, from early on in my life. And then uh, one of my activities is running. So does anybody else want to share?
so you're up uh you're playing it and playing with your dog that's awesome been visiting london of course telescope kayaking college pearls walking outdoors for sure Ah, oh, Olympic National Park. That's on my list too. Um, pets. Yeah, I think pets. Yeah, for sure. And swimming. <laughs> I love that session. <laughs> Buy a car with cash. We're not le we're not leasing out here anymore. That's not that's not what we're doing. This is 2022. Uh, yep. Running, running, yeah, of course, mine as well. So in person, um, you know, we would have three of these. We would take them. Um, you would shuffle them up so it would be randomized, um, and you would flip them. Uh, but you would only be able to pick one of each, right? So one of the upside down cards. Um, and really, the the point of the exercise is to think about well. What if you were in this position um, of the survivor, right? And you had just lost everything that you had written. So all of your answers. So for mine, loans, photos, and running. Let's say I my I got affected by a cat five. Um, I'm financially destitute now because my home is gone. All my photos were in my home and maybe I got hurt so I can't run anymore. And that's my reality now, right? Um, so think about your answers um, and how uh, it, how would you feel if a disaster had kind of taken them away, right? If a scenario um, has potentially put you in the position where your cards um, or your responses now are unattainable or are now gone. And that is the reality for many folks that um, are in situations like this, right? Um, if anybody wants to share, Sarah put, <laughs> Sarah put a gift, but um, I know it's a little heavy, but if anybody wants to share kind of, you know, uh, how does that feel, uh, you know, if this was potentially that uh, that situation, right? Um, how do you feel figuring out uh, that this is the impact of what you had just lost because of a disaster? I know that I, those photos for me are completely irreplaceable. Uh, I would be absolutely devastated and I love running too. So it would be my outlet. My stress outlet is now gone and one of my most prized possessions is gone. So um, Sarah did put a reaction in the chat. I think that very much encapsulated it. But if anybody wants to also um, sound out on the exercise, um, feel free. Okay, hearing none. Um, I know that was a little bit heavy, um, but it is something that we also have to think about as responders, right? And even folks that, um, even folks that um, you know, are potentially going to be able to to help in that. Yes, I guess I could take pictures of them, Jesse, but I just I don't. I guess I've never thought of that. <laughs> I just like I like them being, you know, in that physical copy. But um, thank you for sharing, Hillary. Yes, um, you know, disasters really, really come and um, they hit very specific points of our heart and our, you know, kind of emotional capacity. Um, and losing something that particular, uh, I know, couldn't have been easy. So. Thank you for sharing, Hillary. So we will continue on that note. Um, so we're going to discuss uh, some psychological disaster impacts to survivors, um, disaster survivor trauma process, and how to assist survivors. So this is a pretty, um, you know, heavy unit. Um, so if you need to, you know, get up, look at the sun, shake it off. Um, feel free to sound out on on anything that's on your mind. 
Um, this is a safe space. We want folks to feel welcome and able to um, process what they need to, right? So next slide, uh, we have disaster trauma phases, right? So we talked a little bit about this. Uh, let's get out handy dandy laser pointer. So here we have our typical ADART deployment timeline, right? So very um, important to note, we have our impact here. Um, this is about one to three days afterwards. So that's why I said that about that 72 hour timeline, we let, you know, uh, paperwork process, we let stuff kind of uh, get get through its proper channels, uh, and then it's our time to shine. We have our deployment process here, uh, but it's important to know kind of these um, these areas in which we might encounter survivors at, right? Uh, so this is a great emotional high for them. They see a lot happening. Um, we call it the honeymoon phase, where the community really comes into play. Um, but then we have this huge drop off, right? Uh, we have a huge low, and that's because we have organizations, um, responders, everybody, um, they need to go home. They can't stay that way forever. Uh, it's hard. We do it in short stints. Um, eight arts, um, we, at a minimum, most of the time, deploy for 30 days, um, but we have... Um, to just maximize that cost um, cost to the state and our effectiveness within that time period. Um, but we've deployed for shorter stints, uh, and it's usually a conversation. And if it's in state, there's even more of opportunity for us to be flexible with our time. Um, so that's not only for program managers, but for members too that are interested in, in participating, right? Um, there's there a conversation to be had uh, potentially for for folks uh, wanting to be a part of service. Uh, we do do days of service. Um, I will say that we're planning something uh, with Cedar Rapids or in Cedar Rapids, uh, potentially with the city of Cedar Rapids coming up. Um, very early talks and we are probably going to partner with the United Way of East Central Iowa for a day of service. Uh, to clean up some remaining derecho debris needs from 2020 uh, that have been exacerbated by the 20 um, this year's derecho 2021 I think right um, so if any program managers are interested in that uh, if they're in that area potentially getting some members up for a day uh, even a couple hours uh, just let me know and, and we can have a talk um, so I talked a little bit about some anniversaries, some trigger events, right? So anniversaries are never fun, and uh, a lot of these folks exhibit some PTSD from that, uh, especially, well, you know, if we, we just talked about the derecho, any high winds now. Um, it really kind of triggers those memories, and folks are still working through grief. And we really want to get them to a point of a new beginning, a new normal, right? So everything that we do in this timeline really will allow those survivors to get to this, to get to the new beginning um, faster and quicker, right? Uh, so we've been talking a, little, a lot about disaster survivors. Um, let's talk a little bit about do's and don'ts. Um, you know, something that I always hit on when we're on response is being sympathetic towards um, disaster survivors. We want we don't want to invalidate anything that they're going through, right? So we do want to protect them from danger. We want to provide accurate information because they are going to be getting a lot of information from a lot of people. And we want to make sure what we're giving out is going to be um, actually accurate to help them. Otherwise, they're going to lose a lot of trust in these folks. Uh, and we might end up putting them to a worse place than when we started. We want to be active listeners, right? We uh, we don't want to, um, you know, wait for our turn to talk. Obviously, we're there to get information and give information, uh, but we may be the first people that these survivors are talking to, and they just really need an outlet. Um, and I'm not saying to, you know, obviously bear the brunt of that emotional burden, um, but make making sure that we're actually listening and we're hearing and we're we're trying to deduce of what potentially they might need as well. Uh, but always be friendly, you know, really pay attention. I call it being on, uh, pay attention to how you're standing, 
how you're speaking to them, how you know you're presenting yourself, um, because it's all about trust and making sure that uh, we're we're there for them and providing that help, right? So we don't want to give any false information. We don't want to make promises you can't keep. That's the biggest one. Um, I know it's tough, but making sure that we don't um, make any false promises to these survivors. If you cannot deliver it within 24 hours, if not that day, uh, do not do not promise them anything. I know it's tough, uh, but in the long run, it's a lot better. Um, and small things go a long way. I mean, we typically carry N95s and uh, water in our vans and trucks whenever we go out for assessments. Uh, so if it's a mold infested home or a mold infested basement, just giving out an N95 or, or a bottle of water to them really like starts to build that trust uh, and really starts to build that partnership of we're here to help, we're here for you. We schedule every assessment, uh, disaster assessment um, for an hour. Uh, so typically we're able to get through about five or six a day, depending on commute time. Um, but assessments, to be frank, in all reality, do not take that long. Um, they take maybe about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, I'm sure Les and Naomi can tell you from their recent experience, um, but folks really just want to talk, right? They really want to, to get it out. They want to tell you about what they've been going through. Um, and that goes into building that trust, right? We don't want to pry for information. We just want to be there. We just want to be active in listening ears. So we have some examples of helpful and unhelpful language. So well, we should say things like, I'm sorry you're going through this. Uh, that sounds like it was really tough. How you feel is valid. If you need to cry, it's OK, right? Is there anything we could do? And I can hear how hard this is for you, right? So these are statements that just really validate um, and support the survivor. Um, we're not inserting ourself in there at all. Uh, we are providing kind of the um, the foundation to continue to um, build up that relationship and make sure that uh, when we leave, they understand that we were there to help. We did help um, and that the um, the AmeriCorps message is really being um, really being emphasized and really being highlighted in that community, right? So we don't want to say understand, right? I think unless um, you have actually gone through a disaster that has very much affected you, but even in that in that instance, um, we're there for the survivor, right? Uh, we should just let them go through what they need to go through and for us to do our job. Um, don't say don't feel bad, right? We shouldn't be telling survivors how to feel. Um, they have to process this through their own way or you're strong, right? We don't want to put an emotional burden on them. Don't cry. It was fate. It could be worse. Uh, and absolutely, please, if you ever encounter a survivor, do not call their stuff uh, stuff <laughs> or trash or garbage. Um, I'll give you an example. I was in Southwest Iowa uh, and we were mucking and gutting a home. And uh, this woman was out with us. And unfortunately, because of some post flooding, uh, we weren't able to do the things that we were supposed to do um, because of a lot that was in there. But we were able to at least do some debris removal and cleaning of it, right? So we weren't able to gut, but we could muck. Um, so we were doing that. And I remember going in and grabbing a trash bag uh, full of just wet clothes, right? Um, and I remember just thinking to myself, I was just like, OK, well, I wonder where the survivor wants this and, you know, is this trash or not? And um, she had had a staging pile for all the bags of clothes, which were all in garbage bags at this point. Right. And she. I went up, I was the fortunate individual to go up to her um, and ask her where she wanted me to place uh, this particular bag. And of course, she broke down. Uh, and started crying and, and really was just really out of sorts. And we had a lot of volunteers there that day. So, of course, it was a pretty overwhelming scene, I imagine, for her. Um, but I, I found out after the fact. And, of course, I, you know, I let her cry on my shoulder and we, you know, we move, try to move on. Um, but we found out later that day that a, another group of volunteers, which is why our 
structure is so important. Um, another group, all right, they came in, they weren't affiliated with us by any means, and uh, they were really excited to help this survivor, right? They came in like a hurricane, um, cleaned everything out to the best that they could, and then left. Um, but they were so indiscriminate with what they were doing um, that we had identified and found out that the, the reason the woman was so distraught um, is that they had potentially thrown out her the only remaining thing to her her late father um which was his world war ii uniform service medals uh everything that went along with that so uh it was pretty disheartening obviously um to to see that because we are there to help and if you are ever fortunate enough to go through our just-in-time training uh we talk a little a lot about that of how we always ask the survivor if it's okay um, to do certain things and, and where they want things. And we're there to provide safety information if they do want to keep uh, objects that are, you know, potentially biohazards, but uh, we never want to go go from the uh, homeowner's wishes. So, and again, we are uh, impacts and responders. Um, we are responders and we do incur psychological impacts rather, sorry. Um, so we go through compassion fatigue, right? Um, and that is something that's where it, it just leads you straight to burnout central. Um, you're not able to continue to process because you just, you've, you've had so much of this burden and, and going through all of this, right? Um, we're placed in challenging living situations, challenging work conditions, um, and every profession and everything that we do is going to have its own unique kind of stressors and um, unique, um, you know, hazards that can potentially uh, amplify um, these stressors. And in particular on disaster response, that's that's part of it, right? But we want to just make sure that we're um trying to get to that compassion and satisfaction which i'm sure that many of you have hopefully about um you know the the performance um or the programs that you guys are a part of right so it's the the pleasure you derive uh from performing the service you know that's why i love disaster so much right it's that positivity that excitement the enjoyment from doing your work um and that's through pure altruism um we, we describe it as that warm fuzzy feeling right that's compassion satisfaction um disaster deployment conditions uh we just kind of talked about that it can be difficult and it's really out of your norm uh and it's you know maybe some stuff that you're not used to right like we ate eggs and like toast every day for like a week for breakfast um and obviously we had great dinners but by the end of that a lot of people were pretty sick of eggs and toast um but that's really what we had for breakfast you know and we're able to go out and get our own stuff um but through our own supply um through our own supplied kind of uh meals that that was what we had so kind of have to make do uh and then talk about some self-care during and after disaster deployments. Um, we had talked about a little bit of some compassion fatigue versus compassion satisfaction, right? Um, uh, but of course, burnout, uh, I think we all are um, familiar with burnout and, and whether we have experienced it or have, um, you know, seen it, uh, seen it through others, seen it on TV, seen it through something, right? Um, but it can happen anywhere. It can happen everywhere. Um, if you have unclear job expectations, that's huge. Lack of control. Uh, if you go through extreme periods of either doing nothing or doing a lot, uh, that could really lead to burnout. If your work-life balance is uh, pretty unbalanced, uh, that could definitely lead through that. Um, and then, of course, uh, some secondary traumatic stress uh, by hearing the intense firsthand accounts of trauma uh, that could all lead to this fat, uh, compassion fatigue, right? So we want to make sure that we're staying on the opposite side. This person who seems as if they're hiking and just saw the sun for the first time in a year, um, 
some compassion satisfaction, right? So it's really making sure that we're staying kind of in that spectrum and, and putting some perspective on what we do. Um, and self-care planning is something that really, um, really goes into ensuring that we, we stay in that balance, right? <clears throat> so let's talk a little a bit about disaster operation conditions, right? I'm going to take a sip of coffee. Perfect. My coffee pot actually has an auto turn off, so I've been drinking, unfortunately, cold coffee, but I'm just trying to uh, pretend that it is iced coffee in my own head, even though I'm not a big fan of iced coffee. So disaster operation conditions, speaking of... Right, so we can potentially have tight common living and sleeping spaces. Uh, you know, I'm going to just keep bringing up New Jersey because it's recent in my head, um, but we had 89 people at that camp. Um, we, you know, there was a lot of space. Uh, oh, yeah, I go through going to the microwave like a billion times in the morning. I just can't walk away right now. Uh, hot take. Elizabeth, that iced coffee is better than hot coffee. Very hot take. Um, I'm sure some others might have some uh, differentiating opinions. Um, but yes, a lot of people sleeping in the same space. And you see these folks every day, right? You see them every day, all day. Um, that's part of just being there. But it is for a short amount of time. Um, in the 2016 Louisiana floods, we had about 250 member, uh, members living in a civic hall uh, with cots set up next to each other. Uh, when I was in southwest Iowa, we had about 30 people sleeping in a church attic with cots set up right next to each other. Um, you know, I, I with that, we'll just say that uh, headphones and earplugs are your best friend when it comes to that, right? So it, being adaptable and flexible, so crucial. Limited menu and food options. If anybody has any dietary restrictions, right? We do our best to um, provide that. If you're vegan, vegetarian, uh, pescatarian, any anything under the rainbow. Um, I myself um, have a gluten tolerance, so it's pretty hard for me uh, when we go out on deployments to really get uh, you know everything that I have typically in my kitchen. Um, so a lot of flexibility on sometimes limited menu and food options, privacy and getting emotional distance. That's why I talked a little bit about how camps are so great because we do have that opportunity to spread out even though we are all confined. Um, and it really builds a lot of camaraderie, um, you know, when you are there every day, everybody's going through the same thing. Everybody's understanding what uh, is at stake, right? Um, but it, it does become a while, right? It's long days and or extended weeks of service when we are this. And again, this is for our, our typical response, right? This doesn't necessarily mean what um, you guys might participate in if there is an opportunity here in Iowa or extended. Um, this is just our, our basic example. Um, but the expectation is that we work six days a week. Um, out of seven days with one day off and typically those days are pretty long from you know you probably wake up at six and then you finish your service for the day around I don't know five o'clock we'll go through um, some simulated examples in the afternoon but um, it is a pretty long day and you know you don't get to go home you you're still on disaster you're at a camp um, or you're away from family, away from friends, right? You're away from your pets. Uh, it's tough. But it is also one of the most rewarding experiences of your life, I promise you. Uh, and also limited recreation activities. While we were at that camp, it was hard to go running because there were no sidewalks on the streets. Um, so we had folks literally do run clubs where they just ran around the camp, which was really big, actually. Uh, but it was probably about, I don't know, uh, actually, I'm not even going to speculate, but um, they just did circles around the camp and that was a, a great run for them. And they were able to really provide themselves that um, that outlet right to de-stress. Um, unfortunately, you know, I was I was too busy and was not able to do that, but um, still rewarding nonetheless. Uh, so we had an activity here, but again, 
uh, we are not in person, so you guys are spared. Um, but in your uh, participant workbooks, I highly, highly, I will keep saying this, um, recommend um, that you guys go into there after the fact uh, and you just take a look and you um, write down some feasible self-care activities for you guys um, that you're able to do on disaster. But we will, um, if anybody wants to put in the chat, um, say you're at a camp, uh, the nearest town is about a 15 minute drive away. Um, what are some activities that you think that you could do on disaster um, that would help you with your uh, self care list, your your de stressor? Um, I would say that I um, I definitely always bring an assortment of stuff um, to be able to kind of like de stress, right? So I do have my laptop, uh, but I try and bring some books, uh, some journals. Um, and then one thing that I always bring that I find a lot of joy in is a disposable camera. Um, and I always take pictures of my experience on disaster. So if anybody wants to chime up or put in the chat of what they think that they could do as kind of a de-stressor activity uh, while on disaster. And I guess it does. Um, it does depend on where you're at as well, but. What about Katie when you're in Nevada? What were some things that um, that we did? I definitely I brought my crochet projects. It is true. Yeah, Katie, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, Katie is a knitter uh, and. Um, that was great as well. Uh, deck of cards, absolutely, Sasha. That is like, we played Uno and one of our disasters, like nobody's business. Binoculars, yeah, for sightseeing, that's awesome too as well. Some craft supplies, that's great. Yeah, typically, I mean, we try to, you know, we could talk about it, but we um, usually bring like a backpack and a, and a duffel if you can. Um, but it is, uh, you know, difficult to figure out what to, to kind of pack in there. Like, yeah, a ball. That's that's really awesome. We had a, a hacky sack team and a Frisbee team um, the last time we went and they got a lot of joy out of that. And again, the more we share, right, um, some folks, you might pop in uh, an act activity or an opportunity that someone might not have thought about. Um, so with your sharing, you could potentially be helping others in this situation. OK, well, I appreciate those. Uh, well, so we're going to talk a little bit about how to assist survivors. So we have kind of um, unwritten mandated reporting, um, you know, how to assist responders. Um, so with this, right, we have uh, a couple opportunities that we want to be able to um, observe uh, if something is going on, right? I think that we know each other. Uh, we want to pay attention to our personnel. Um, if you see any signs of compassion fatigue, changes in behavior, just take a note, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that something's brewing, um, but we do want to assess uh, based on the severity of those symptoms and what we know, right? Like if uh, John Doe is typically really happy uh, and gregarious and really vocal, uh, and over the last couple of days on deployment, he's been really withdrawn and really quiet, right? That may be an indicator that something's going on. Um, and I think there's a couple questions you have to ask yourself, right? So like, even if you're a member or program manager, um, taking into account where you're at, right? If you're pretty burnt out, um, you know, a couple of days left before leaving, you know, is there someone you could escalate it to, you know, maybe go talk to your incident commander on the ground because that's what they're there for. Um, 
do you personally have the emotional and mental capacity to help someone else, right? If not, go talk to someone you trust uh, who potentially is either higher or um, lateral on that scale of uh, a leadership and responsibility. Uh, offer support if you can, right? We talked about that. If you have the capacity to support, offer it. Um, do the same things, right? Active listening, be friendly, authentic, don't try and pry. Um, People will talk to you as they kind of want and as they are able to. Uh, but really, I think the biggest, biggest thing, um, if you know you think someone's in danger, if they're going to put others in danger, please, please, please um, report to either your crew lead, your team leader, um, you know, who uh, the incident commander, who, whoever is in a position of authority to be able to support that individual. Um, we, we really have open and safe spaces when we're on disaster. Uh, and I I really open it up personally for myself, uh, for anybody, I, I don't care, you know, if, if one of the team members wants to come and talk to me about something, like feel free, right? Like we, we really want to make sure that we're showing kindness to not only ourselves, but others. And that really helps deescalate those tensions, especially when other ADAR personnel on the mission are, are kind of facing similar stuff, right? Um, but what's important is uh, even after we're leaving, right, or after we have left, is to continue that self-care. Um, allow time for some re-entry, right? We just went from a very, very, you know, heightened bubble of activity and then going back to quote-unquote normal life isn't the most uh, easy thing, especially when it's so, you know, instantaneous, you go from being on disaster, you're doing all this stuff to now you're, um, you know, back, back home and, you know, whatever those activities may mean, it may be tough. Um, and we want to uh, make sure that we're being adaptable as well, right? If you're, you see or feel your self-care activities, um, not necessarily working. We want to make sure that uh, we switch them up and we change them and adapt and make sure that we're uh, being the best us that we can be for us as well. And when self-care isn't enough, please, um, again, feel free. Know that uh, it's brave, safe space to tell someone this isn't a character flaw. This isn't you, right? Um, everybody goes through uh, trials and tribulations and tough times. Um, and we just need to understand and know our resources and be able to um, access them and be able to discuss when needed. Um, it is something that uh, is not a fault, right? It's not a weakness. Um, it's just knowing when it's appropriate to ask for help. and. Uh, when self-care isn't enough as well, we always provide um, our resources of uh, the suicide prevention hotline and we have the disaster distress hotline uh, and I'll send these out afterwards as well. But these are always available on site um, and we always have information for those that are really going through a tough time uh, to be able to kind of get those help and uh, get the resources that that is needed so that is the end of our section here um does anybody have any questions any thoughts anything they want to go through all righty let's take uh, let's see. Actually, it's eleven thirty. Let's take uh, like a five minute break, and then we'll finish out. Um, and then we'll come back and um, yeah, so we'll finish out, and then we'll get we'll get ready for lunch and take that break. So let's just do a couple minute break, uh, just for folks to use the restroom if they have close it out and then we'll get started. So we'll come back in like 11.23, 11.23.
Okie dokie. So here we have a testimonial um, that one of our members did in New Jersey uh, about what disasters meant to them. And I had sent this over to the DSU. So if you see DSU specific stuff, just know that they had used it and geared it to um, essentially provide uh, like their own strategy team. So. Let's see, hopefully it'll work. If not, I will go to the other one. is kind of the most compelling thing that I get to do. There is a tremendous amount of fortune in being given the directive and armed with the resources to do good work. <laughs> work where the more you do, the more good you manifest. I mean, that's profound. I think it'd be almost disingenuous to imply that there wasn't a certain kind of selfish aspect to it. It's empowering in a way that starts to shift your worldview. I mean, the, there's a kind of mental bully that a lot of people like me have where we look at the world and it seems like there's nothing to do. It's all that's too bad. And what a shame. But going on these disaster deployments adds evidence to the belief that we're, that these things have, if not solutions, things that will help. That, that doing something works. Disasters are becoming more common and it, in the trajectory of the world, it seems like things are going to get a lot harder for a lot of people over time. What disaster means, what Disaster relief operations mean it it means that action in it means that inaction is no longer an option. And there's lots of reasons that everyday people can't do what I what I get to do here. Right? The lack of time and lack of resources is a preclusion that is real and understandable, but it means that it can't be that no one does anything. Disaster means I reject an inactionable reality. Awesome. So that was Dylan Foster Hood. Uh, he had participated in two disasters, one of which was uh, in the uh, Nevada Vaccine Initiative. Um, and then he and his crew were an integral part uh, in the New Jersey response. But I do want to pick some folks' brains. Uh, so just hearing that, uh, have any thoughts kind of popped into your head? I'd love to hear uh, maybe from some other folks that have participated in disaster, maybe something similar to Dylan's comments about what disasters meant to you and uh, national service as well. Uh, 
I'll go ahead and share. Um, so the the work that I had done was the vaccine uh, clinic and. I oftentimes say this when it's related to anything AmeriCorps. Sometimes I feel like I get a lot more than other than the people in in the that we're serving. But um, I think it kind of gave me a little. It, it reduced my sense of hopelessness a little bit, like that uncertainty of the of the pandemic, and I could help someplace. Um, and I know just as a response from like, you know, as you're escorting some somebody who might not be able to be very ambulatory to a vaccine spot in we had it in our an old mall store. Um, the level of appreciation for someone to be there with you during it. And I think that was kind of a mutual, you know, um, that that's that's the sense that it gave me is just a belonging and and reduce that hopelessness or fear of the unknown. That's awesome, Sarah. Sarah thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I definitely felt the same way during the pandemic as well when we got to go to the food banks um, and be able to at least support in that capacity because it felt like a lot of, um, you know, seeing on the news of everything that was happening and then not being able to do anything. And then once you were actually able to help, it was a uh, pretty uh pretty great not only for yourself but obviously of course you're helping people that couldn't be you know more thankful and grateful for you and what you're doing so definitely a two-way street um does somebody anybody else want to talk about their experience sharing experience or either comment on dylan's comments um in his time in new jersey and it can be you know actual response or it could just be seeing um seeing response in general and and kind of how you um how this conversation so far has uh maybe pivoted your thoughts one way or the other Um, I can talk a little bit about my time in New Jersey. Um, with the like deployment, it was really, really hard, but also super rewarding at the same time because you know you're there and you're helping people that really need the help. Um, there was like a few moments that were really stressful for me but having like camaraderie of different teams around and all the people was um, like really helpful and bonding in a way. Yeah. No, I haven't. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Naomi. Yeah, just having a lot of folks that are going through the same thing um, can really do a lot for for people and a lot for um, some folks that are actually on the ground and going through going through that. So I did want to share um, some metrics here. We'll see if it'll allow me to pop up maybe. So we have. Um, no, hold on. Uh, so some of the stuff that we were able to complete um, in some recent times. So uh, here in Iowa, just for everybody to have kind of like an awareness. Um, so for the 2020 derecho, we were still uh, working through some unmet needs uh, over the last year, and we've uh, we were able to get some AmeriCorps members, not only from the Conservation Corps of Minnesota, Iowa, but from the Habitat for Humanity uh, mobile response team. Uh, in a couple days, we we're able to assist three counties, uh, cleared over 100 cubic yards of debris. Uh, we are able to partner with Homeland Security in that endeavor, uh, calculated over 100 volunteer hours, which again goes back to um, aiding the city and the state. 
Uh, and then we did some uh, data computing, which cleaning up uh, some of the data in the uh, unmet needs list, right? Um, so here you can see some photos. And of course, uh, through our time uh, in working there, uh, we accumulated zero cases of COVID-19. Um, so that was fun revisiting kind of that project and still, um, I think, uh, putting into everybody's heads um, that there are still remaining needs um, even a couple years after the RHO. And we had talked about uh, Marshalltown and that tornado uh, that hit there, um, and they're still working through that, right? And that was almost five years ago now. Uh, we were talking about Nevada, uh, so we were able to support the Get Out the Vaccine initiative in Nevada, to which we were canvassing and passing out uh, informational flyers to uh, socially vulnerable populations that were in zip codes that were identified by FEMA, right? Uh, so we had four ADART members um, from the Habitat MRT, and uh, Naomi, who's on the call, um, is actually right here, and then Katie from Habitat as well. Um, and we were able to go there for about 20 days and we uh, distributed 25,000 informational flyers, uh, had almost 400 personal individual interactions, and we interacted with around 30 businesses. Uh, and in those uh, zip codes that we canvassed, um, the vaccination rates uh, increased 50% uh, than when we were before. And during this, um, this was July through August, uh, we incurred zero cases of COVID-19 as well. Um, and here, just a very brief narrative, but um, after we really started to hit our stride and efforts, um, we were given some great feedback that vaccine providers were running out of stock, uh, and we could really start seeing the percentages of vaccinated individuals in those targeted canvassing zip codes to, to steadily rise, right? Um, but it was it was definitely an interesting um, deployment, um, and I, I wanted to include this as well, just to show that we not only participate in kind of those direct services, but I would say that this was a pseudo direct service capacity building endeavor for FEMA. Um, their folks weren't able to provide this uh, due to a federal mandate, um, this activity at least, uh, so they called upon AmeriCorps and um, some of the best Feedback that we had gotten was uh, comparatively to other groups. Um, they could definitely see our numbers um, reflective and kind of are um, reflective of the A, I guess I will say, in our, our um, reputation. And I myself, I am right here. <laughs> and then New Jersey. Um, so this is our most recent disaster. Um, we were able to complete 110 work orders, uh, 106 damage assessments, over a thousand yards of cubic debris cleared, which is your standard American washer machine. So if you imagine 12, uh, 1200 washer machines, that's what we took out from homes in our time in New Jersey, a total of 54 mucking guts, and then almost 100 emergency mold suppression cases. And we helped uh, close to 600 people. And even with 86 members in eight arts, um, we are able to have zero cases of COVID-19. And it comprised of mainly 10 programs from uh, that were deployed across the country, uh, which included Southwest Conservation Corps, North Carolina, Texas Conservation Corps, a uh, bunch of them, right? Almost 20,000 hours of member service. Um, and we were deployed again to New Jersey to, to help from the remnants of Hurricane Ida, which increased its strength once it got back closer to the, the Northeast. Um, and myself in particular, I led this, uh, this mission assignment um, as Volunteer Iowa. I brought a couple members as well um, that we were able to integrate into the incident command structure, um, but primarily um, we had Texas Conservation Corps and myself leading this mission, um, but I was the incident commander. So uh, it was a great time. Um, we, we did a lot of great work. We had a lot of dedicated individuals uh, here. You could see kind of the mess hall that we ate at, and we took a group photo before some folks started to demobilize. Um, because like I said, although the length of the mission was a total of around a month, um, some folks came for a couple weeks, um, you know, whether it be like 
12 days or so, right? It all just worked out to what they were able to provide uh, in the time that they were able to provide. But here you can see some folks getting ready and suited up, uh, and we'll have more examples later um, of, go of uh, going in and uh, actually providing those direct services. So I uh, just wanted to give you guys a little bit of that overview. And again, right, some ADART power after Hurricane Ida, what we were able to provide. Um, perfect. So we are a little ahead of our schedule, so I really wanted to save um, some of the modules for the afternoon, but I'll I'll throw it to the group. Um, if you guys wanted me um, wanted me to continue into the next module, I could do that, and potentially we could end a little bit earlier in the afternoon. Um, or if you guys would like to take the break now and we could come back at one o'clock um, and then we'll finish probably right around time. So I'll leave it to the consensus group who would who would like to speak up. Would you like me to continue or take the break now? So it'd be about like an hour and a half lunch. Getting a couple neutrals, a couple breaks. Okay, well, I um I think I'll just dive in very briefly and present the overview so we won't be missing much. Um, so for the folks that do want to take a break, I would say feel free. This is also recorded. Uh, we're not going to dive into this section deeply. I'll just give the overview and then we'll take a break. I think that's a happy medium um, in between. So. OK, so we're going to be going over. Uh, some risk management and safety here. Uh, this is something that I preach every day, all day uh, when I'm on disaster. Uh, it's split into two units, uh, which includes safety and risk management. <clears throat> and first, we're going to be going over safety. So we had talked a little bit about this uh, earlier. Um, but safety first in all things, right? So this is going to be the overview. Uh, why safety first? Safety where? We're going to identify some locations that we should be practicing um, our safe. Uh, general safety considerations, uh, ADAR safety methods and tools. Uh, and then potentially we'll get into some safety trivia. We'll see kind of where the uh, where it takes us. So. Uh, we want to, at the end of this unit, understand and adhere to safety expectations as it pertains to the DSU uh, and describe safety tools uh, ADAR to use during mission assignments. So we have our own specific ways that we um, make sure that everybody is being safe and what those expectations are. Um, so we'll get a little more in depth on that. So I hope everybody Knows the answer to the question. Pop quiz. What is the first DSU expectation for FEMA mission assignment operations? What? Yep. <laughs> safety. Absolutely. Safety everywhere. All day, every day. S A F E T Y. Safety. It's your wordle of the day. Lock it in. Uh, OK, safety first, of course. And why safety first? We're going to be going over a couple categories um, that touch on this, right? Um, so why safety first? We have credibility here, brand, partnership, trust, injury. 
right? Uh, every single one of these sections are inherent um, with safety. Uh, so of course, at all times, we want to be preventing injuries as much as possible. It is very easy to get injured even on the, the dumbest of things, um, things that just seem completely uh, non-hazardous, right? Um, that is something where I think the most accidents actually happen. When we are the most complacent, um, it is when typically uh, we see that injuries tend to rise and occur when we're the most comfortable, right? Um, how do you guys think that uh, safety plays into trust and community trust and also our credibility? You can put it in the chat or stand out. Why, why do we include credibility and trust when we talk about safety? We had talked a little bit about it with survivors before. Yeah, that's definitely part of it. People feel supported and they trust each other. Um, but if we weren't working in a safe manner, right, disaster survivors wouldn't trust us and that would definitely ruin our credibility, right? If they saw someone chainsawing very precariously on a ladder, um, they're probably not likely to, you know, recommend those folks to a friend or, you know, talk about them in the best light. Um, we want to make sure that we practice safety to instill the trust, not only in survivors, but also our community partners, um, the agencies that are uh, hosting us and sponsoring us there, right? So that goes into our partnership. Um, and we also just want to protect our brand. We have, um, you know, the A for a reason, and we're connected to many other organizations and partners. Uh, and if we're working in an unsafe manner, we aren't introducing America, AmeriCorps well to the community. Um, I think for anybody who's worked in a disaster, even if AmeriCorps um, did not, um, you know, was not known previously, uh, after we leave, I guarantee you, um, it is absolutely known. Our footprint is there in the most positive light uh, because we follow and we trust and we know these guidelines uh, and we're able to provide those services in a way to where uh, we are doing the most good and we are mitigating any harm that could potentially fall upon um, those survivors. But we are public servants, right? So we are deployed under a FEMA mission assignment. Uh, and we're utilizing taxpayer dollars. We must, uh, when we're working in an area, uh, ensure that we are following, obviously, like OSHA and laws and our operations are safe and we're upholding the trust that was placed in us because we were brought in for a reason. Um, we were brought in to ensure uh, that what we are doing is going to be to the best benefit of the state. Uh, and we have really built that trust in our brand over many, many years. Um, but in, you know, in general, uh, we want to ensure that we're just having an environment that's as safe as possible. So we always say uh, when on a disaster deployment that if you see someone not being safe, uh, please sound it out. Uh, safety is imperative uh, to aid our operations. And we want to make sure that when we are operating in a community, um, we're providing again those services to those partners. But also, you are, you know, you owe it to not only your your coworkers that are there, but um, your fellow members um, that are also trying to work hard in this endeavor. Uh, we want to be respectful to them in in that aspect. So. So I'll go through safety where, right? Um, so again, we should be practicing safety everywhere uh, in all things that we do. Um, we have uh, 
you know, a couple examples here. So I think the most uh, important thing, and uh, it may surprise you, but the most dangerous thing that we do when on any disaster deployment is driving. Uh, driving to sites, from sites, um, wherever we're going, um, that is the most uh, dangerous activity that we participate in um, just because of the environment, right? So we don't know uh, potentially how those road conditions are, um, but we, if we're going to an outside community, we don't know how they're going to react. Um, I'll tell you that when we were in New Jersey, that was the, the biggest thing because some of those drivers um, some drivers in the Northeast are pretty, uh, pretty aggressive and we have to really practice defensive driving um, and making sure that our folks are, are um, okay coming and leaving sites, right? Um, so again, traveling, right? Even getting there, if we have to take a plane, just making sure that we're following safety protocols. Um, when we're on site right here, you have a great uh, ladder ratio. You have someone uh, supporting the ladder just in case, right? So if the roof may be, um, you know, somewhat compromised, I'm hoping that that guy is uh, wearing um, fall protection, but it may be low enough to where they don't need fall protection. I forgot the ratio. Maybe one of my habitat folks can tell me what the ratio is and to need fall protection. But um, yeah, so you could see them wearing PPE. Uh, you know, they have their hard hat. You know, positioned at a, a proper space. Um, even in the offices, we want to make sure that we're pro we're uh, practicing um, safety and in, in terms of cybersecurity, we have a lot of sensitive information, and we want to make sure we're keeping that safe. Um, we're not giving out our personals. We're not giving out any numbers that could get traced back to us. Right. Um, that's usually a big thing that someone's number ends up getting leaked out at some points, and then bam, you have 200 survivors uh, contacting you for assistance, and um, it's a big, big deal. Uh, and then, of course, lodging, right? So we have so many people housed in this area. We want to make sure that we're being safe in terms of our spaces. That's why we try to limit uh, how much stuff that we could bring on disaster, because we don't want to cause any tripping hazards. Um, you know, there are some there have been instances where folks have tripped on some stuff and have fell awkwardly and then have had to, you know, get sent home. It's um, tough positions to be in. And we just want to make sure, especially when we're in mass congregate shelter, even though now with COVID, um, that's not really a thing too much anymore, at least for responders. Um, at least in Louisiana, I think they just implemented the, the first one in a while. Um, but we want to make sure we're being considerate to others, right? We have a ton of people that are going to be sleeping in our area and we want to make sure that they're not going to trip over something and then get knocked out of the deployment. Um, and that's why these trainings are just so important. We want to, you know, just be thinking about safety again all the time, everywhere, uh, and making sure that we just have uh, that at the forefront. Uh, and again, we had talked a little bit about this, but general safety considerations. Uh, maintaining security, uh, maintaining health and personal safety uh, in PPE, right? So when we maintain health and personal safety, we talked a little about that, about um, making sure we know where and how to access water, food, bathrooms, wherever we're going to be working, uh, understand the environments that we're going to be working in, right? So what we may encounter. We're working outside a lot, maybe in the winter, making sure that we pack appropriately, right? Um, always knowing uh, what PPE to bring, and this is all documented and talked to about um, with the DSU beforehand, even leaving. Uh, and security, of course, uh, it's like cyber security. We don't want to give out any uh, personal information, making sure that um, Nothing that we are documenting uh, potentially could get leaked to the public because it could be a PR nightmare. Um, there is an instance uh, during one of the floods. Uh, I don't remember which one, but we had an ADAR member take a picture um, of one of the homes that they were working on. Uh, it got picked up by a news station. Uh, and then a survivor saw it on TV, and that was actually that survivor's home that they saw for the first time uh, in months. And it was absolutely disheveled, right? It was just 
um, in disarray, disrepair. Um, and that's not something that, uh, you know, an instance that we want ha to have happen where a survivor is seeing their, their home for the first time on TV uh, and not with their own eyes in kind of their own safe space. So it's tough, uh, but we always want to be um, thinking about this stuff and making sure that we, um, we are holding each other accountable as well. And that also uh, with security too goes in with uh, maintaining that not only um, sensitive information, but personal equipment, right? Supplies and vehicles, like if we're in a more urban environment, making sure that we lock everything, um, even in a rural one too, uh, you, we never know what prying eyes there might be and uh, we don't wanna lose uh, very expensive equipment in another state, especially uh, equipment that potentially need, is needed for, um, you know, host site activities. So security and safety is everybody's uh, job and um, should be everybody's mantra as we go through. So I'll do this slide uh, and then we'll call it for lunch. So some ADAR safety methods and tools. Uh, we have a safety officer, uh, whether your job is a dedicated safety person, right, uh, position. They are the ones that are documenting where the nearest urgent care is, how to get, uh, you know, emergency routes if there is another disaster. Um, they do uh, home visits, site visits, uh, making sure that all ADAR personnel, volunteers, homeowners, um, maybe that are present on a site are upholding safety guidelines and standards um, because believe me um, homeowners can be pretty tricky to work with especially if they want to be involved uh, and they're not really following any safety guidelines uh, we have a team roster that everybody is aware of and the act team right uh, so everybody has everybody's numbers and we have a call down tree uh, that goes along with that to make sure that um, if an incident does happen, um, we're able to quickly and adequately um, report to one another that they should come back or any guidance that needs to be um, needs to be given. Uh, and then we have an incident action plan. Some of you guys may be familiar with that, maybe not. But it's basically a report uh, that we do usually every 24 hours. Uh, if you're lucky to get into a, a disaster response um, phase to where it could be 48 hours. Uh, that's pretty great. Um, usually 24, but it outlines current messaging, uh, pertinent safety information, general uh, awareness messages, but it also outlines um, where everybody's going to be working the following day, right? So it's on tw that 24 hour cycle. So it's never for the current day, it's for the following day. Um, and uh, it, yeah, so it, it gets sent out to everybody and it um, essentially lays out everything for uh, what the mission is kind of undergoing and it gets sent to FEMA partners in a very um, redacted way. Uh, so it not only allows us to provide some situational awareness 